Hello, welcome to QuickBooks Online. My name is Cindy McGugan, and I'm going to help walk you through this series of videos. I wanted to take a few moments in this introduction video and just give you a little bit of information about what to expect as you go through the course, and also let you know a little bit about myself and my background. I've actually been a software trainer for about 20 years. I teach a lot of different types of software, QuickBooks being one of those. I'm also a QuickBooks consultant. I work with both the desktop and the online version. I'm going to be able to relay some information about both as we go along, but more importantly, we're talking about the online version here. The online version has an advantage, and that is that you'll be able to access your company file from anywhere you happen to be that has internet access. If you work out in the field, for example, you might have your laptop with you or need to access it through your phone, and these are great reasons to sign up with a subscription for the QuickBooks Online service. We're going to actually take this from the very beginning. I'm not going to assume you know anything. I'm going to actually start off showing you how to go online and pick the correct subscription. We'll talk a little bit about working with QuickBooks Online and mobile devices, and then we'll take it from there and start actually setting up our company file. We're going to work with customers. That side of things is called accounts receivable. You'll need to know how to create invoices what to do when the customer pays you, how to actually put that money in the bank. We're also going to talk about the flip side, which is your accounts payable. That's anything that has to do with the bills that come in the mail that you have to pay. You'll want to track those so that you know at any time how much you owe. We're going to be going through and talking a little bit about products and services. Those are physical things, and sometimes they're a service you provide, but sometimes you buy products and you also sell products, and we need to know how to set those up properly. We'll be looking quickly at payroll. There's a lot of other things we'll look at, but I want you to have a really good foundation for building your company file from the very beginning. When you watch these videos, make sure you watch them in order. They won't make very much sense if you get them out of order. Make sure you watch them all and make sure you watch them till the very end because a lot of times there's a really good piece of information right at the very end of one of these videos. If you have questions as we go along, feel free to shoot us an email and we'll get right back to you and answer your questions. With that being said, let's go ahead and get started. We're going to flip over to section two and talk about the different subscriptions that you have available when you decide to go with QuickBooks Online. Thanks for coming back. We are just getting started and the very first thing you'll need to do before you start using QuickBooks is actually sign up with one of their subscription services. It is not free to use the QuickBooks Online. You do have to pay for it monthly and they have four different subscriptions that you can subscribe to. I want to go ahead and pull up the website so that you can actually look and compare the different ones with me as we go through this. All right, what you'll want to do is make sure you navigate to quickbooks.intuit.com and you'll see this screen right here, which will give you a lot of different information on their subscription services. One thing I want to point out is that they do have a try it free for 30 days for each of these. That way you can see if you like it before you actually jump in and make a purchase. I want to scroll down here because you'll notice that this is where they have the different subscriptions listed, and I want to compare these with you. The pricing that you see here may change depending on when you watch this video. You'll notice for each of these that they have a monthly fee, and right now you can save 50% off if you sign up for this three months at a time. The simple start is the really basic one that you'll want to start with if you're a brand new business and you don't have a lot of customers, maybe not a lot going on with your business yet. It's great to start with this one and then you can always upgrade as you need more of the features. Let me go ahead and go through some of these features with you. You'll notice for the simple start that you can only have one user and that basically means that only one person can log in with that username and password. If you need more, you'll notice that if you look at the essentials, you can have up to three users. Uh, the plus has up to five and then you can have up to 25 if you're actually using the advanced. Let me scroll down a second because I want to show you that there are a lot of really good things about the simple start. 
You'll see, for example, that in addition to multiple users, you can track your income and expenses. They'll all let you do that. All of these will help you maximize your tax deductions. They'll all have mileage, invoicing, and accepting payments. They're all going to have reports as well, but you'll notice that the simple start and the one that's to the right of it only give you the basic reports where if you need some more advanced reporting, then you'll want to go with these two over here, which are the plus and the advanced. And even with the basic reports, you're going to have a lot of reports. QuickBooks is really good about reporting. You can do estimates in all of these. If you think about a construction company, you would want to actually estimate a job before you actually start doing the work and getting paid for it. And that's a really great feature they all have. Let me see scrolling down here. You'll notice that you can track sales and sales tax in all of these. You can capture and organize your receipts, meaning you can scan them in. You can also manage 1099 contractors in all of these, and that's really important because those are what you call your subcontractors, and you need to know how to properly handle those. You're going to be able to actually manage the bills if you go with the essentials, the plus, or the advanced. So notice that if you have the simple start, you can't handle the bills in QuickBooks. And to me, that's really important because you want to track everything you owe because you're going to need to really stick to your budget when you first start your business. You cannot track time if you have simple start, or you can't do what they call tracking job profitability in the simple start. Even though, like I said, this is great for a new business starting out, you'll quickly want to upgrade to one of the others. Moving on to the essentials, the essentials just doesn't have the inventory feature, the job tracking profitability. You can kind of see the things here it does not have. You can't send batch invoices. And really, if you don't do a lot of these, it may not be important to you. The one that sometimes people want is the inventory feature, and you would have to upgrade to the plus or the advanced to get that. You'll notice that the plus is the most popular one, and it does not have the options for importing and sending batch invoices. It doesn't have the business analytics and insights options, but you may not need these. If you do want all of that, you'll want to go up to the advanced subscription here. The other thing I want you to know is that you may go back and forth with these subscriptions because it could be that you add users like we saw earlier and you need to have maybe four people accessing your QuickBooks. So there's a lot of different things you need to think about and you can always call them if you're really not sure which one would work best for your business. I wanted you to be aware of that because the next thing you'll have to do is actually start with one of these and you can actually choose to go ahead and buy now or like I showed you earlier, you can go up to the top of the screen and you can actually try it free for 30 days. And that's where I want to stop right now. We're going to go through and talk about setting up your company file after you pick a subscription over module two. But before we do that, I want to briefly talk to you a little bit about how QuickBooks Online works with mobile devices over in Section 3. I'll see you there shortly. Before we go ahead and wrap up Module 1, I wanted to briefly talk to you a little bit about some things QuickBooks does with the online version and how mobile devices actually work with QuickBooks Online. The first thing I want you to know is that your online version is constantly evolving. You might log in one time and be used to where a particular option happens to be, and the next time you log in, it may not be there at all, or it may be in a different location or look different. When they roll out the changes, they do not roll them out across the board for everyone at the same time. That's why your friend may have a version and he or she does not see the updates that you see, but you'll eventually get there. The other thing I wanted to mention is that you have the ability to use different mobile apps for QuickBooks and they sync with QuickBooks. Depending on if you have an Android or an iPhone, you can just go into your Play Store or go into the App Store in your iPhone and just look for the QuickBooks apps and you'll notice that if you download one of them, You'll be able to take it out in the field with you, and for example, if you need to create an invoice out in the field, you can do it right there on your phone, and it will sync with your actual online version. Now, the apps will not have all of the options that are available, but they will have the basic, most common ones that you would want to use. 
Go ahead also and look in your app store and see if there are other software apps that aren't made by Intuit but would work well with QuickBooks and it might be something that you might need in your business. So there's all kind of apps that work with QuickBooks. I just want to make you aware of that and if you ever wanted to just get a handle on what some of the changes are that they're making in your version, you can actually log into quickbooks.intuit.com forward slash blog and then you'll be able to see all of the changes and stay on top of what's new. That's going to wrap up Module 1. Let's go ahead and jump into Module 2 and start talking a little bit about working with the company files that you have to set up in QuickBooks. We're starting to work in Module 2 now and this is where we're going to talk a little bit about the QuickBooks company files. Anytime you create a file in QuickBooks, it is called a company. You can have as many companies as you would like. Often what you will see is a small business owner might set up one company with his personal information and another company that has the business information. Company files do not talk to each other. You don't have to worry about the data getting mixed up. And like I said, you can have as many as you like in QuickBooks. You have to either create a brand new one, which we'll do in Section 3, you might already have the desktop version of QuickBooks and you want to upload your file to the online version. We'll look at that in section two. But real quick, what I want to talk to you about here is the fact that you do have the availability of a sample file that you can go in and play with as much as you want. You do not have to sign up with a subscription or anything like that to access the sample file. All you have to do is head on over to qbo.intuit.com forward slash redr forward slash test drive and the company file you're going to be working with here is Craig's Design and Landscaping Services. It is a service-based business. Let's go ahead and head on over there and we'll check out Craig's Design and Landscaping Services. The first thing you will have to do is just verify your real person. I'm going to check the box. I'm not a robot. And then in this case, it asks me to pick all the bicycles. I'm going to go through the list and make sure I got them all. And I'll hit verify. Now it knows that I'm a real person and I can access Craig's Design and Landscaping Services. Now, while this is pulling up, let me just mention a couple of other things about the sample file. Every day they update the date, so you'll see that date change. You're actually going to be working in the year 2021 in the practice exercise, so just kind of know that when you go in here. And this is what QuickBooks looks like when you first open it up. Now, I do want to go through the screen and get you familiar with everything, but I want to do that over in section four. Before we actually go through this, I want to show you how to upload your data if you wanted to bring your desktop file over or in Section 3, talk about creating a new file. So we'll come back to Craig's Design and Landscaping Services a little bit later. Right now, I want you to head over to Section 2 and let me show you how to upload your QuickBooks desktop files to the online version. Okay, we've already looked at some of the sample files that QuickBooks has. We now need to talk about how do you actually go through and set up your new QuickBooks online account. All we're going to do is navigate to where we looked at the different online subscriptions over in Module 1. And then we'll go ahead and decide which of those subscriptions we'd like to sign up with, or we can sign up with a 30-day free trial. Let me go ahead and flip over, and we will sign up for that 30-day free trial to show you how this works. As you can see, I've navigated back to quickbooks.intuit.com. I think I'll take advantage of the free 30-day trial. I'm going to use this link right here. If you see a pop-up that asks you if you'd like to sign up with the 30-day free trial, you can use that option as well. What I'm going to have to do here is create an Intuit account, and I can do this a couple of different ways. I can actually sign up with Google, and if I have multiple Intuit products, then I can go ahead and use that one login for all of them. I might also choose to use an email address and sign up that way. I think I'll go ahead and do that and use one that I just set up for this and it's got my name here. 
Also, it asks you to plug in your mobile number. That's recommended, but you don't have to. And the reason that you may want to go ahead and do that is if you happen to forget your username or your login information, and Tuit can help you recover that information by looking at your telephone number that you've plugged in. You will want to create a password and make sure it's something that you're going to remember, but hard enough that someone else can't actually try to get into your account. Remember, a good password anywhere in your computer will have at least 8 to 12 characters. You're going to have a combination of capital letters, small letters. You might have special characters. I'm going to go ahead and choose a sign up with email once I'm done. And this is going to create my Intuit account. I do get the option to skip the trial and go ahead and purchase my subscription, but I think I'll go ahead and continue with the trial for now. What's going to happen now is it's going to start setting up what we call our company file. Each file in QuickBooks is called a company. You can have as many companies as you like in QuickBooks. This is going to launch us through what's called the Easy Step Interview, where it's going to ask us some questions, and based on how we answer those questions, it will set up all the options in our company file for us. First, we'll see some basic information. It wants to know what is the name of your business. I'm going to call mine ABC Services. And then the next thing it will ask us is to describe the type of business you do. Now, if you start typing in things like plumbing, electrical, things like that, then it's going to start pulling from a drop-down list and looking for those first few characters there. And if you see something close to what you do on the list, just choose it. There's no wrong answer here. Just choose something close to what you do. I'm going to pick, for example, services, and you'll notice that there are several types of services that it thinks I may want to choose from. I'll just pick professional services in this case. Another thing that you have an option to do is if you've been using the desktop version of QuickBooks and you'd like to bring that data into your online version, you have the ability to do that. You can check this box and then it will take you into your computer so you can find that file. We are going to talk over in Section 3 about how to prepare that desktop file so that you can pull it into your QuickBooks Online file. I'm going to leave it unchecked for now and click Next. The next thing it wants to know is what would you like to do in QuickBooks? And you might want to do a lot of these different things. You might want to send and track invoices, organize your expenses, manage your inventory. If you have retail sales, you'll want to choose this. If you don't, you may want to leave that alone. Maybe track your bills, track your sales tax, pay your employees, and track your hours. So you can see that you can choose a few of these or all of these. I'm going to click Next at the bottom. And now it says, what is your role at the business? Are you an owner? Are you the bookkeeper? Maybe the employee? Usually the owner of the company is the one that sets up the file, or it could have been that the accountant set it up for the owner. Whichever person set it up is actually going to be the admin or the administrator of the file, meaning that you'll actually own it. I'm going to go ahead and choose owner in this case. And if I scroll down a little bit, you'll see that it says, do you have an accountant or bookkeeper right now? And you don't have to say yes, even if you do have one. It's just asking you this because it's going to set up some of the options as we go down the road for the accountant if you happen to have one. I'm going to say right now that I'm just going to do it all by myself and I'm going to say all set at the bottom. And now what you have is a basic setup for your QuickBooks company file. There's still a lot we have to do because it's really a blank company file right now, but at least we have the file set up so that we can work on it. If you wanted to go through a 30 second tour to help you get down to business on QuickBooks, you can do that. I'm going to go ahead and close that out. And then that is what it looks like when you first log in. You are on what's called the dashboard right now. And a dashboard is just a quick way to see an overview of how different areas of your company happen to be doing. Now I do want to take time and go through this whole what we call user interface here. I want to do that over in section 4. So right now let me show you how to log out and then where to go to log back in. If you notice in the top right hand corner of your screen you have a gear icon and you can use the sign out option right here and that will go ahead and take you back to this screen. Now let me navigate away from this 
and then we will come back and you will see how to log back in. So I'm at Google now and when you're ready to log in you want to go to quickbooks.intuit.com which is where we were earlier when we first created our account and this time you want to go over here where it says sign in. Notice that you'll sign up with the particular one that you actually subscribe to. If you haven't subscribed and you're still using that 30-day free trial just use the QuickBooks Online option which is the first one and then that'll take you back in and you'll be able to log in right over here. And that's all you need to know right now as far as setting up your company file. Well, let's go ahead now and talk real quick over in Section 3 about how to actually go ahead and upload your QuickBooks desktop file if you wanted to bring it into your online account. If you happen to have been using the QuickBooks desktop version and now you'd like to pull that data into the online version, there's a little process you need to go through. And once you go through the process, then you'll want to run some reports to make sure that all your data pulled in. Let me go ahead and show you how this process works. What you want to do is open up your company file in the desktop version and then go to your menu and click on company and down near the bottom you will see export company file to QuickBooks Online. If you don't see that option what it means is that you have some updates that you need to do in this version of QuickBooks before you can export this. In order to do those updates just go to help and you're gonna see it'll say update QuickBooks right here. Now go through that update process and when you're finished, close the company file, then open it back up. And when you do, you should see the option to export your company file to QuickBooks Online. Now what's going to happen here is it's going to ask you to log into your online account. Once you click start your export, here's where you have to log in. So I'll go ahead and put in my email address again gmail.com and I'll go ahead and put in my password and I'm going to sign in. Now what's going to happen here is if it doesn't recognize you then it'll want to send a code to your email to confirm your account. If you had plugged in your phone number when you set up your account then it could send you a text that way. I'm going to go ahead and tell it to confirm and I'm going to flip over to my email and get that six digit code and I'll be right back. I've got my code now. I'm going to go ahead and plug it in and then I'm going to hit continue at the bottom. It's going to ask me a couple of quick things before it can actually pull it up to the online version. This particular one says, do you want to bring over your inventory? If you say yes, you want to go ahead and select a date that you want to go ahead and pull it in from. I'm going to go ahead and say I'll pull it in from January of 2020 and I'll go ahead and hit continue. The next thing is it wants me to choose my existing QuickBooks online company file. Now if I have more than one you'll see them all listed here and I just choose the one that I want and then I'm going to go ahead and hit continue at the bottom. And now it's preparing my company file which is Larry's Landscaping and Garden Supply here. This process could take a while. What will happen is you will actually get an email from Intuit once this process is complete. Once it is complete, what we'll want to do is go ahead and open both the desktop version and the online version and run some reports. Now this one finished pretty quickly. I'm going to go ahead and click on OK. And now I should get an email from Intuit. Remember, if you don't get that email, it's not finished yet. It might look like it's frozen, but it's really not. You'll get it eventually. Now let me show you the reports that you want to run to compare your data. In either version, it doesn't matter which one you do first, you're going to run a profit and loss and a balance sheet. In the desktop version, you'll go to Reports, Company and Financial, Profit and Loss Standard. Now when the report comes up, there's a couple things that you need to do. Make sure the dates are all. That way you capture everything in your company file. Also make sure you're running this on an accrual basis right up here. You're going to want to run that one. Then you're going to want to run the balance sheet. You're going to go back to reports, company and financial, and run a balance sheet standard. 
Make sure that you pick all dates. You'll have to scroll up to the top for that. And make sure you're running it on an accrual basis. Even if in real life you use the cash basis for this report, run it on accrual so that you can make sure you've got everything here. Now I'm going to go flip over to the online version and show you where to go in there to pull those same reports. Back in the online version, the way you run your reports is if you notice on the left hand side over here, you'll see it says reports. And then you'll notice that both the balance sheet and the profit and loss are already set under your favorites. You can run either one first, it doesn't really matter, I'll just start with the profit and loss. And if you get screens like this that says customize, go ahead and just close that out for now. And what you'll want to do is make sure that you choose all from the top of the list here. And then make sure you hit run report. And you can see there's the data. Now you'll do the same thing with that balance sheet. You'll go back to reports over here on the left. You'll run the balance sheet. Make sure that you're running this on a accrual basis. And also make sure you're looking at the dates all at the top. You'll want to make sure accrual is chosen right there, like I said, and then run your report. Now print those out and compare those two. If all the data is the same on both of those, then you got everything. But if one's different than the other, then it didn't actually export all your data and pull it up to the online version, and you may want to try it again. And that's how you're going to pull your data from your desktop version into your online version. Let's go ahead now and move over into Section 4, and I'm going to give you a quick overview of how the screen looks. We call this your user interface. Okay, what I'd like to do in Section 4 is go ahead and give you a quick overview of what the user interface looks like. Basically, the screen, when you pull it up, what is it you're seeing, and how do all those pieces and parts work. Let's flip over to QuickBooks, and I'll give you a quick overview. When you first log into your company file, you're going to be on what we call the dashboard right here. And basically the dashboard is just a quick overview of how the different areas of your company are doing. A couple things you'll notice, you have the ability to add your logo. You can just click here, search your computer for your logo and pull it in. There are some things over here that it asks if you'd like to start doing. You can click there. So if you wanted to start invoicing, for example, you could choose that option. You can also go ahead and set up some payments, send your first invoice, and swipe cards in person with your mobile app if you happen to have that set up. Now, some of these things are not free. They are fee-based, meaning that Intuit will sell these to you. So for example, if you'd like to be able to accept credit cards, then they can set you up with a merchant services account. You'll notice down here are all of your invoice options. So think of this as your accounts receivable. This would be the amount of invoices that you have outstanding that have not yet been paid. Over here are your expenses. Those would be the bills that you've put in. You would be able to see any of those that you had not paid yet as well. So think of this area as accounts receivable and this as accounts payable here. Where it says profit and loss, that is the most important report in QuickBooks because it will tell you if you've made money or if you've lost money. And then over here, you'll just see all of your bank accounts. And if you wanted to click on one, you could. Let's say, for example, I wanted to go to my checking account. This one here is called checking. If I double click and open it up, that will take me directly to the checkbook register. Now I'm going to close this message real quick. We're going to spend some time in the register a little bit later, but that's a quick way to get into the register. Now if I wanted to go back to the dashboard, all I have to do is come back over to my navigation pane, which is what this is called, and click on the dashboard, and I'll be back to where I just was. This is called the navigation pane on the left. If you went down to banking, you would see all of your banking options. I'm going to click on banking here. And what this is going to show me is how to actually set up my account so that it is connected to the bank and I can pull in my transactions. Now, I'm going to talk about this a little bit later, but you don't always want to do this. If you are actually using the invoicing feature in QuickBooks like you should and receiving payments 
or if you're using the bill feature and paying the bills correctly, then you don't want to enter information twice. So you can set it up, but you're not always going to want to pull in data from the bank. Now, if you had a credit card, it would work perfectly. Now, I know that probably doesn't make sense yet, but we will talk about some of that stuff a little bit later on. Over under expenses here, expenses are things that you have to pay out. You had to enter some bills, you wrote some checks to pay those, maybe use the purchase order system. You can kind of see all that right down here. The next thing is your sales. These are the things that you actually sell to your customers. You'll notice that under sales, I can look at invoices. I can also look at my customer list as an example. And I'll just show you what that looks like real quick. This is going to be a list of all of your customers. And you can see that they're set up alphabetical, in this case, by last name. We're going to spend time on customers a little bit later, but that's how you get to the customer list. You also have different projects that you might work on. In the desktop version, they call these jobs. In here, they're called projects. You might have a particular customer you're working with, but you might have multiple jobs or projects going for that customer. Under the workers option, this is where you're going to find your payroll options. There's a ton of reports we're going to be looking at a little bit later. You've also got a place where you can go in and look at your sales tax and also payroll taxes if you're doing payroll through QuickBooks. You've got an option for mileage where you can go in and plug in which vehicle you drove, which job you went to, which customer you worked with, those types of things. Accounting. Now this is going to be the one thing you want to remember how to get to because this is very important. This chart of accounts is the backbone of all accounting. When you spend money, what did you spend the money for? If you receive money, was it a sale you made from your business? You're going to have to tell QuickBooks where all the money connects to in what we call the chart of accounts. We are going to be going through the chart of accounts over in module three. Notice also, this is where you would reconcile if you wanted to reconcile your credit card accounts or your bank accounts. You do that right there. You're going to see my accountant, which is the next one here. If you actually have signed up with Intuit to use one of their QuickBooks Bookkeeper Accountant people that they have available, then this is where you would go to actually find that person and invite them to be a partner with you, as they call it. There's also some apps that work with QuickBooks. You'll see that right down here. They've got a list of some of the more popular ones, some of the trending ones, or if you wanted to look through some of the different apps down here at the bottom and pick one that you might want to use, you can do that. Down here where it says Live Bookkeeping, this is actually where we were just talking about a few moments ago, you could actually go to My Accountant and have a, an accountant partner with you. They also have what they call Live Bookkeeping where you can actually pay into it and you get a bookkeeper that will take care of your books for you and both of you have logins to your company files so that you can both get in there and do your work and you can also have conversations. So you'll be able to talk to them live as well. And then the last thing here is what we call a cash flow. This is something new that will be coming to QuickBooks very soon. It's called the Cash Flow Center. And you can see that it's going to let you know what else is going on with your cash accounts, meaning with your checking account and things like that. And you get a screenshot over here. If you want, you can join the wait list. And when the actual cash flow center is ready to go, then they will send you an email and just give you some more information about it. Now, one thing to keep in mind, I did tell you way back in the beginning that if you happen to log in tomorrow and let's say, for example, this new button here is not there, look for it or look for the options that were underneath it already because they've just moved them somewhere else. And that's just something they did recently, actually, is they used to have those options right over here and then they moved them here recently. Now, just to tell you what the new is, anytime you want to create something new, like a new invoice or maybe add a bill, those types of things, you'll see that in this list. And you'll notice that where it says money in, all of these options are your accounts receivable. Anything having to do with customers, whereas money out is your accounts payable. 
And then where it says other, these are just some other things that you can create new transactions in QuickBooks if you click on one of these particular options. The other thing I want you to be aware of is what we call the gear. And you're going to see that right over here in the top right of your screen. And we're going to go through the gear options over in module three. I just wanted to give you a quick overview of how this whole user interface looks and how it works. Now that you have a quick overview, let's head over into module three. And that's where I want to spend time talking to you about customizing your QuickBooks files. We're starting module three now, and I want to start off this module by briefly just talking to you about the gear menu. There's going to be a lot of places in QuickBooks where you can customize things to make it work a little bit better for you. But let's go ahead and start there so that you can see what some of the options are and where you would go to make some changes to your company file. The gear option is in the top right hand corner of your dashboard right here and you're going to see that when I click on this it's going to give you some lists that you can look at, it's going to give you some of the tools that are in QuickBooks, you're going to have access to some of your company options that you might want to go in and change like maybe the address, things like that, and also it's got what they call a profile menu for your Intuit account right over here. When you're looking in here, you want to get really, really, really familiar with a couple of these, specifically this chart of accounts right here. We're going to spend more time on that later in this particular module, specifically in section four, we'll get started with that. But everything in QuickBooks will run through the chart of accounts. That's why it's so important that you know where that is. Don't confuse the gear icon with this new option way over here. This is where you're going to click if you want to create a new transaction. Maybe you need to create an invoice, maybe you need to create a bill, maybe you need to do something like track your mileage. Those are all new transactions you could create. Just recently, they've moved this new button over here and renamed it. It used to be right up here and everyone got confused between the gear icon and this. Now they've moved it way over here so that you don't get confused anymore and it says new meaning new transaction. That's really all I wanted you to know about the gear menu right now. What I want to do now is take you over into section two where we're going to use the gear icon to go ahead and customize some of the options for your company file. In section one, we got familiar with the gear menu. There were lots of different options in there that you can use to customize how your company file works. And I wanna take you into the gear menu now and into some of those options and show you how to customize some of those different things so that your company file works best for you. Let me go ahead and flip over to QuickBooks and we will dive right in. I'm going to click on the gear icon and I want to start over in the first column underneath where it says your company, you'll see an option that says account and settings. These are going to be like preferences or options that you can turn on or off or edit in QuickBooks. As we go down the tabs on the left, and we'll start with company, if you want to change anything in these different sections, just go over to the right and click on the little pencil icon and that will take you into the edit option. You'll notice here that I can add my company logo just by clicking the plus sign and that will let me navigate through my computer to find my logo. I could edit the name of the company if I like. Also, you might want to put in your EIN number or your social security number. You're going to use your social if you're a sole proprietor and you really don't have payroll. If you do have payroll, you're going to have to have your EIN number in here so that QuickBooks can use it to help you with your payroll. I'm going to hit save and that's going to save that little section. The next little section says company type and you'll notice the first thing is the tax form and then the industry. I'm going to click over on the pencil icon here and I want you to notice that you have the ability to add whatever type of tax form that you actually file when you do your taxes at the end of the year, you can add that here. Now let me just make a little point here. You do not have to pick anything here. As a matter of fact, if you do not file your own taxes, if you have an accountant, 
then I would pick other or none every single time. Your accountant will know what type of tax form that you file. If you pick any of these options, what will happen is when you're working in different places in QuickBooks, there will be an extra field that says which tax line on the tax form would you like to put this on. You're not going to have a clue if you're not an accountant and you'll just get stuck there every single time. So why see that field and get yourself stuck? I'm just going to pick not sure, other or none. And the other thing is you have an industry you chose when you first set up your company file. I chose professional services. You can change that if you want, but I'm going to leave that and hit save. The next little section you'll see here has to do with your company email. You're going to have your customer facing email. The difference is that the company email is the private email that you like different things sent to from Intuit, for example. The customer facing email is the one you want the customer to see and that can actually be redirected to your company email if you don't want to have to open 15 different email accounts. You can always have as many email accounts as you want and redirect them to the one you'd like to funnel everything into. There's a place to put in your company phone and your company website here. Again, you would edit that over on the right and the company address down at the bottom. Same thing, you can have a company address that's seen on the back end and then one that's called customer facing, meaning that's the one that the customer actually sees. Let me go down on the left here to billing and subscription. This is where you're going to be able to go in and upgrade your existing subscription if you'd like. You'll notice that you can subscribe right from here and you can see all of the options and we've talked a little bit about these before so I'm not going to spend much time on that. The next one on the left is usage. There are some limits to some of these different subscriptions. For example, when you're using the QuickBooks Online Plus and you need more room, you'll want to go ahead and upgrade your subscription. For example, the one that I'm using only allows me one user. If I want to add a user, I may need to upgrade my subscription. There is a number of items you can put in the chart of accounts as an example. It's 250. Just a little FYI, the desktop version allows you to have 14,500. If I need 251, then I need to upgrade my subscription. And then down here where it says classes and locations, you can have up to 40. And if you need more, then that's another reason you would want to upgrade your subscription. I'm going to go over to sales on the left. And there's several things in here that you may want to go ahead and work with. Now, later on, we'll look at customizing the look and feel of your different forms. For example, if you have an invoice and you want to add your logo or something like that. But these are some things you can turn on or off right here in your forms. For example, let's say that you like to invoice your customers and you want the customers to automatically have terms of net 10, for example. Well, currently they're net 30. Let me go ahead and click on the pencil icon and show you some of these. Here's where I could change this to one of these other preferred invoice terms. If you're not familiar with the ones that say 1% net 10 like these three and there's 2% net 10 and 8, basically what that means is the customer invoice will be due in 30 days, but if they paid in 10 days, they can take 1% off. It's a way to get your customers to pay you early. If you have a preferred delivery method, you can choose it right here. Do you like to print things now or would you like to send things later? I'm referring to an invoice as an example. Here where it says shipping, if you don't ship anything, then you can go ahead and uncheck this and this will say off. If you do ship things, then you had some options down here where you can have sales reps and put in purchase order numbers, things like that. These are custom fields. You can also turn those off if you don't need them. If you want PO number, not sales rep, for example, just uncheck the sales rep option. You can have custom transaction numbers, and that basically means that if you want to put in your own transaction numbers, you can go ahead and set that series up. You can have a service date field. You can also have fields for the discount, deposits, or tips or gratuity if you use that. You can just go in and turn these on or off. I'm going to hit save right there. The next thing you're going to see is products and services right over here.
And you'll see there are several different options related to that that you can turn on or off. For example, if you don't track inventory, you can actually turn off this inventory option right here. I'm going to go ahead and cancel that. There's also some options for late fees. There's also some for progress invoicing. And let me just mention what that is, just so you'll know. If you estimate jobs, construction is a prime example, you're going to want to take that estimate and turn it into an invoice at some point so that your customer can pay you. You do not have to pull everything from the estimate into an invoice. You can pull in 30%, for example, or maybe you want to pull in certain items that were on that estimate into an invoice. If you do estimates, you will want progress invoicing. There's a couple more options here. Let me scroll down. There is an option for messages when you actually email a form. So let's say it's an invoice, for example, or what they call a sales form. You have the ability to email it directly to your customer. You can set the default message and I'll go ahead and click on that one so we can see. You can say dear or you can say to. Notice you can have a merge field if you want to have their full name, their last name, first name. And you can use the standard message that you see right here below when you're actually sending out that email. You can also have a copy email to yourself every time if you'd like. I'm going to go ahead and hit save down at the bottom. A couple more things I want to point out. You'll notice that there is an option for reminders. And I want to briefly tell you how reminders work. But before we do that, I think we'll go ahead and stop the video right here. Let's go over into the next section and I'm going to talk to you a little bit more about some of these other options here for account and settings. Hey, welcome back. Let's go ahead and finish up talking about customizing your company file. This is actually part two of section two. Let's go back down to reminders. I'm going to click the pencil icon. There's a couple of options that you want to be familiar with in here. You have the ability to set up invoice reminder emails. For an example, if your customer is late paying an invoice, or you just need some reason that you want to remind your customer to pay that invoice, then you can go ahead and either use the standard message or you can go ahead and edit the one that you see down here. And you'll see it just basically says, this is a reminder we haven't received your payment yet. You do have the ability to insert a placeholder, which basically means that anywhere in here, you can put in the company name or the invoice number. And that would actually be a merged transaction is what they call it. It'll pull from QuickBooks that information. You can email yourself a copy and you can go ahead and save this when you're done. You also have options for online delivery down here at the bottom. You'll see these are email options for all of your sales forms. Your options for this will be when you actually email your sales form over to your customer, do you want to have a short summary show up in the email or show the full details in the email? You can also attach it as a PDF right here. And some additional options you have is if it's an online invoice, you can actually set it up for Edge 2 mail or if you want it to show up in plain text, but you probably want to leave it online invoice and then click save. And the last one I want to mention at the bottom here are statements and I'll go ahead and show you those options. A statement goes out at the end of the month and basically it starts with the balance from the prior month. It shows all of the transactions that month and then what the customer owes at that point. It's really a gentle reminder for your customer to go ahead and pay you. Statements are not mandatory, but they certainly do help when you're trying to collect money. You'll notice that when you print statements, you have an option to list each transaction on a single line or list each one, including all the details on that particular one. You can also show the aging table at the bottom of the statement. And what that means is it will have a field that says one to 30 days. Another one says 31 to 60 and another says 61 to 90. And that way your customer will know where they fall in that particular aging table. I'm going to go ahead and hit save. And those are your options that happen to be under the sales. Let's look at the options for expenses. Expenses are things you have to pay. Bills that come in the mail that you have to pay, for example. 
Your options are to show item table on expense and purchase forms. You can track expenses and items by customer. Make expenses and items billable and default bill payment terms. Make expenses and items billable. Let me just tell you what that means real quick. If you have to purchase a product or a service and you want to make sure that you invoice your customer so you can get reimbursed for it, instead of just manually putting those receipts in the car or keeping them on your desk, QuickBooks will remember those expenses. And when you're ready to invoice the customer, you can just pull them in. You also have the ability to use the purchase order system. So if you don't use purchase orders, you might decide to turn this off. Also, you have this option called messages at the bottom. This is a default message that will be sent when you send purchase orders. I'll go ahead and open that one so you can see the default message. You can also edit this to say anything you'd like and then make sure you save it when you're done. The next tab on the left says payments. This would be customers paying you. There's a couple things you can do. One is if you want, you can sign up with QuickBooks to receive payments quicker by going through this little service QuickBooks has that's very similar to the way PayPal or Zelle might work. You just sign up for it. If you want to learn more, you can click here. And that way you can actually email an invoice to a customer, for example. They can click a button right there and pay you right then and there. QuickBooks will automatically be updated once you're paid from your customer. If you already have some sort of existing account with Intuit, for example, they have something called GoPayment or Merchant Services, you can connect it to your QuickBooks as well right here, and this is where you connect. And the last option says Advanced. There are several things here I'll just mention briefly. If you want to have the first month of your fiscal year start maybe in September, you can actually go ahead and change this. It's going to default to January. Make it correspond with your real existing start of your fiscal year. You might have a different date for the beginning of your income tax year. So you can go in and change those. Your accounting method is set for accrual. When you run reports, you can run them on an accrual basis or cash basis. Accrual basically means that as soon as you invoice, it shows up as income whether customers paid you or not. As soon as you enter a bill, it will show up as an expense whether you've paid it or not. If you change this to what they call cash basis, you will only show the income once you receive the money from the customer or you'll only show the expense once you actually spend that money. I want to mention closing the books as well because this is an option that you'll want to think about. In real life accounting, what happens is you close the books at the end of the month and you close the books at the end of the year. And what that means is if you want to make a change in a closed period, you can't do it. You need to make an offsetting entry in the current period. Your books are not closed automatically in QuickBooks. It doesn't remind you anything. So if you want to close them, you have to come here. You'll be able to go in and you'll be able to tell QuickBooks that you do want to close the books and then you can set a closing date. Let's say you set it for December 31 of 2019. That means that after you are working in the next year but you see a change you want to make in 2019 prior to December 31, you're not going to be able to change it. I'm going to go ahead and cancel out of that. We talked a little bit about tax forms earlier. You want to make sure you keep that one. Also, the chart of accounts. I know you haven't seen it yet, but basically everything in QuickBooks will run through this chart of accounts. And currently they do not have general ledger numbers. They're just a list alphabetical per each type. If you want to turn on general ledger numbers, you can turn them on right here. Also, you have some options for the markup income account and we'll address that a little bit later. Let me mention real quick the track classes and the track locations. Locations means if you have different physical locations for your business, you can turn this option on and every transaction that you work in, you can choose which location you want that to go to. Classes is very similar, except it's not really locations. Think about this. Let's say that you happen to have two different divisions of your company. 
you might use those for your class list and everything you do make sure you pick the correct option from the list. There's some things about forms where you can have it pre-fill automatically, automatically apply payments, things like that. You might want to look through that at some point. A project would be like a job related activity. You'll notice that you have the ability to organize all of those job related activities in one place and that is turned on. You're also viewing QuickBooks in the business view. There is an option to go ahead and also see this in what they call the accountant view. Time tracking. If you want to be able to track the time that you or your employees spend working on different projects or jobs, you have the ability to do that. You can also come down and change the currency. There's some date options and things like that all the way down here. That means there's a lot of options in here that you can go through and set. You're going to want to look through these. You don't have to get them all right away, but at some point if you want to set these, you just come back in and make all these changes. I'm going to go ahead and close that with the X at the top right, and that's going to take me back to the dashboard. Let's go ahead and now move over to Section 3, and I'll show you how to manage users. One of the things that you will want to do is make sure that each person that is using QuickBooks has their own login. You'll give each person their own username and their own password. Only the administrator can add, edit, or delete users. You can have up to five users in your QuickBooks file. If you need additional ones, you can think about upgrading your subscription or purchasing those additional ones that you might need. The reason you want to have these additional users set up is because if you want to track down errors, then you'll want to know who was logged in at the time that that particular transaction was changed. You can run an audit trail to see a report on which user was logged in, what the transaction used to look like, and what it looks like now. You also will be able to limit the user's access to certain areas of QuickBooks. Let's go ahead and flip over and I will show you how to manage the users. Keep in mind that the administrator has to be logged in in order to work with the users. I'm going to go up to my gear icon in the top right hand side of the screen and in the first column you'll see an option that says manage users. The first thing I want to point out is that normally if you're using one of the basic subscriptions then you only have five what they call billable users in your plan and like I mentioned earlier you do have to upgrade if you want to have additional users. The admin is considered one of the five users and you can see here is the admin name. If you wanted to edit the admin information you can choose the edit over on the right and then come over here to edit user settings. Typically, when you first set up QuickBooks, you're going to see the email address that you signed up with right here under the first name field, and there won't be anything where it says last name. You could come up here and change those like I did. I'm going to go ahead and hit save at the bottom. If you want to add a user, just come over to the right here and click on add user. Your user that you're setting up can have what they call standard rights, which means that you can choose to give them full rights, but you can also choose to limit their access to certain areas, or you can give them company admin rights, which means they have access to everything. These options up here count towards your five user limit we discussed. These here don't because you might have someone you want to be able to log in just to run reports or maybe just to do time tracking. I'm going to go ahead and choose standard user at the top and click next in the bottom right hand corner of the screen. The first thing it asks me is how much access do I want to give this user? Now if you say all, notice it will include payroll and it will check that and you can see all the different things they have access to over here. If I go ahead and uncheck that, you'll notice that the things they don't have access to do are down at the bottom. They can't add or edit employees in this case or delete payroll transactions. It could be that I say none. I don't want them to have rights to any of these accounting features, but they can still manage other things in QuickBooks, like submitting their own timesheets, things like that. I can also give them limited access, meaning if I want them to be able to do things with customers, you can see the choices here. Or if I want them to do things with vendors or both, you can see I can check both and you'll see all the options here as well. I'm going to go ahead and click next. 
and now it asks me do you want this user to add edit and remove users we're going to say no and I wouldn't change that because you want the administrator to have rights to everyone if you start giving everyone full rights to change users and that sort of thing then what's the point in even setting those up notice that you can also give this person permission to edit the company info or if you want them to manage the subscriptions you have the ability to do that as well I'm going to go ahead and click next at the bottom then it says we'll invite them to create a QuickBooks account and password for each to access the company file what you're basically going to do here is the new user you'd like to set up you're going to put in their first and last name here put in their email and they will actually get an email saying that the administrator would like them to become a user they would accept and then they can set up the username and password make sure that the administrator knows that information you wouldn't want to have an employee that has their own username and login information and the administrator doesn't know what it is and can't have access to what they do that's going to be very important for you I'm going to go ahead and just X out of this because at this point what would happen is once they accept it then you would see their name down here as a user and that's really how the users will work I do want to show you the audit trail report but we'll do that when we get over to reports a little bit later let's go ahead and wrap up this section and let's talk over in section 4 about the chart of accounts we're getting ready now here in section 4 to talk about the chart of accounts the chart of accounts is probably the most important thing in QuickBooks every single thing in QuickBooks will flow through the chart of accounts somewhere the chart of accounts is basically a listing of different areas where you might actually spend money or you might receive money as well and you want to make sure that your information goes into the correct categories that way when you run reports you have accurate information there is a part two to the chart of accounts make sure you watch both parts so that you have a really good understanding of how the chart of accounts works let's go ahead and flip over to QuickBooks and we'll get started there are a few different ways to get to the chart of accounts one way is to go through the gear icon and in the first column you will see the chart of accounts another way is just go over to the left and click on accounting and there you will see the chart of accounts as well and this is what your chart of accounts looks like remember that every single thing in QuickBooks runs through one of these that's why it's so important that this is set up correctly but let me quickly give you a quick overview of how the screen looks you'll notice the first column is the name of your account when you're setting these up you can pretty much name these accounts anything you'd like but make sure that you name them something that makes sense to you or whoever happens to be looking at your reports the second column is the type and notice that it's currently sorted by type we're going to be going through all the different types so that you'll know which ones you need to set up to make sure that you have everything you need I want you to notice also that when you're looking down this list and you see the type for example income notice that the names are alphabetical and that will be true of each of these types if you look at the expenses here then these are alphabetical if you want to turn on general ledger numbers you have the option to do that and let me show you what it will look like if you do you'll actually go up to your gear icon then you're going to go into account and settings then you'll want to choose advanced on the left hand side and under advanced you're going to see an option that says enable account numbers right here currently they're off if I choose on just by clicking there and choose enable account numbers notice that turned it on and I can show account numbers and then save and I'll show you what this looks like now let me go ahead and close this and you're going to see now that you'll have a new column at the beginning here where you can actually go through and put in your own account numbers there will not be any here automatically you have to add them the way you would add them is the way you would edit any of these accounts just come over to that line that the account you want to edit is on you'll see a down arrow and you'll choose edit and in this window you have the opportunity to add your new account number right here 
I'm going to go through this screen in a minute, so I'll just close that for now, and I'm going to go back and turn those account numbers off for just a moment. Account and settings. It's going to be the advanced option on the left, and I'm going to go ahead and turn off enable account numbers just by clicking that word on, and I'll uncheck these and save that. Now let's go back and finish going down our list here. The next column that you're going to see next to the type is going to be the detail type, and that's just telling you a little bit more information about the type that you chose. There's also the QuickBooks balance and the bank balance. The QuickBooks balance would be if you had entered some transactions in QuickBooks, what is that balance for that account? The bank balance column will allow you, if you pull in your entries from the bank, that's called downloading your transactions, then you'll see what that balance is as well, and you can see that you can match those up and see if you're in sync here. And we'll be getting into that a little bit later. But right now what I want to do is start talking to you about the different types of accounts you'd want to add, and then we'll add a few so you can get a feel for how this works. The first type that I want to talk about are bank accounts. You'll notice there are no bank accounts at the top of this list. That means that right now you do not have a checking account, you don't have a savings account, any kind of bank account. You have the ability to add these. You're going to be doing this by clicking over here where it says new. And the first thing you're going to do is pick the account type. In this case it will be bank, but notice all the other types we're going to be talking about. Where it says detail type right here, just go ahead and pick the option from the list that closely matches the account type you've chosen. Over here is the name of the account. When you name your account, you can name it anything you want. If you want to call it your bank name, you could do that. If you want to call it operating account and maybe another one called payroll account, you can do that. Just whatever you like to name it. I'm going to go ahead and leave it on checking for now. Description is totally optional, and there's not a sub-account right now, but later on I'll talk to you about how sub-accounts work. The other thing you want to think about is a start date to start tracking the money in this checking account. Now what you want to do is, if it's the beginning of the year like it is currently, then you probably want to go back to January 1 or the beginning of your fiscal year and put in all the entries. If that's the case, then you can choose beginning of this year. You might decide if it's later in the year and you're starting your QuickBooks file to go ahead and start with the beginning of that current month. You can also pick other. The reason you might want to pick other is what if you have a bank statement that cuts off in the middle of the month? That would be an option where you can tell it a specific date to start with. It really doesn't matter what date you start with. Just try to make it correspond to the start date of your bank statement. I'm going to go ahead and say beginning of this year, and I'm going to go ahead and put in the balance. The ending balance on 1231 of 2019 would be the exact same number as the beginning balance of 1-1-2020. You'll want to get that number from your bank statement. I'm going to go ahead and say it was $250.62, and I'll go ahead and hit save and close at the bottom. And now you'll see at the top you have a checking account and you have a balance of $2.50 and $0.62. Cents. You also have the ability to view the register. I just want to show you that real quick. If I come over here to view register, then this is what the checkbook register actually looks like. I'm going to close this. This is just some information on what a register looks like and what it's supposed to do. Anytime you want to go back to the chart of accounts, you'll notice right up here it says back to chart of accounts, and that's going to take me back to the screen. Now I also want you to notice something that happened. Anytime in accounting you do something like this, then you will have a debit and a credit for that transaction. You'll notice that in this case, the flip side of the money went to an account called Opening Balance Equity. And that's the way it should be. You can't change that. Just know that whenever you have a starting balance, which could be a minus number if you have a loan, but this is going to be an actual picture of what your books look like. So don't freak out if you see a negative number there. It's an accurate picture of your books. Let's go ahead and talk about some other bank accounts. You obviously would have savings, money market accounts, things like that. But think about, do you have PayPal? Do you accept Square? Those are bank accounts as well. So if you do accept those, 
then you want to set those up as bank accounts. What would eventually happen is you would transfer money from PayPal or Square into your checking account, or sometimes you go the other way, but those are just bank transfers. The next type I want to talk to you about are your assets, and you'll see there are a couple of these here. An asset is something that your business owns that makes it more valuable. You're going to have equipment, you're going to have chairs, desks, lamps, vehicles, property. Assets fall into one of two types. There are fixed assets, which are things you plan to keep long term, like the vehicle or the property. Then there are what we call more liquid assets, or QuickBooks calls them other current. Inventory is a great example of that because I'm worth more right now because I have inventory in the back room, but my goal is to sell it and get it out the door. Now what's going to happen with assets is you're going to set up big bucket categories. And what I mean by that is instead of listing each vehicle the business owns, you're going to have a category called vehicles and they'll all dump into that one category. You don't want to have a hundred different categories for your assets because no one wants to sit there and look at that. Just have big buckets, maybe seven to ten good ones. Some of the common ones that I see are vehicles. You might have one called furniture and fixtures. You might have one called property if you have a lot of property. You might have equipment. But again, they're just big buckets. This is where the accountant's going to be very helpful to you because the accountant's going to help you decide which categories to set up. And also when you start talking about the money part, then the accountant's going to help you plug in how much the vehicles were worth and depreciation and things like that. QuickBooks does not do depreciation and that's because there are multiple ways to do it. If you had 10 accountants, they might all tell you a different way they want it done. So just know you want to have the account set up so that if you go to the bank to get a loan, for example, the bank will know that you do have some assets. We're going to move down the list, but before we do, I want to go ahead and stop the video here and have you go over into part two and we will continue talking about the different types that you'll need to set up. We're in section four and we've just talked a little bit about how to start setting up some of the accounts in your chart of accounts. I want to go ahead and finish telling you how to set up the rest of those accounts. So let's flip over to QuickBooks and we'll keep going. The next type that I want to talk to you about are what we call your liabilities. A liability is something you owe. Now I'm not talking about the monthly payments you have to pay for the electric bill, things like that. What I'm talking about is a loan you've taken out of the bank. When you think about your liabilities, there are really two types. There are what we call long-term, which are things that you're going to pay on for more than 12 or 13 months. And then there are short-term, which is under a year basically. And QuickBooks calls them other current liabilities. When you set up your liabilities, you want to set up a separate one for each loan that you have. And when I say loan, it could be a car loan. It could be you as the owner decide to set up a loan where you put money into the business and you want to get paid back. You might have borrowed from the bank. Those are all different liabilities you want to set up and each one should be set up separately. Let's set up a car payment so you can get an idea of how you would set up these accounts. I'm going to click on new. And the first thing it asks me is to pick the account type. Here, you're going to see your other current, which is the short term, and your long term liabilities, which is what I'm going to choose in this case. Another thing to notice is that where it says detailed type, if you see notes payable, that's just an accounting term for a loan, basically. Over where the name goes, this is where you're going to pick the name that you want for your loan. I'm going to call mine the Bank of Any City, but you can call this anything you want. Sometimes what I'll see people do is put the last couple digits of their account number here just so that they can see which loan they're looking at when they have it pulled up in front of them. Description is totally optional. This is where you might say that this is my 2019 Jeep Cherokee loan, or you can leave it blank. And then we're going to have to pick a start date. Now remember, if we're starting our company the beginning of the year, what you'll want to do is, for your beginning balance here, find out what the amount you owed as of, in this case, January 1 was, so that you can plug that in. 
it's not the amount you started with when you purchased the vehicle two years ago, it's the amount you owed as of the start date of your company file. I'm going to put $15,000 in here and then hit save and close at the bottom. And now what you're going to see is that you have a loan right here. Notice it says Bank of Any City and the balance is $15,000. Every time you make a payment on the loan, this is the account you want to put it to. Your car payment is not an expense to the business. Do not set it up as an expense account. It is a loan and you want to know when you've paid off the loan. You'll also be able to, on each individual check that you write, you're going to be able to put in how much is principal and how much is interest there. The other thing I want you to notice here is look at your opening balance equity. It's a negative number and that's because I said that when you owe something it's a negative number and this is an accurate picture of what your books look like. Let's talk about credit cards a little bit and I'm talking about credit cards that your business uses to purchase items for the business. This has nothing to do with accepting customer credit cards. You want to set each credit card account up separately so that you can track each one. I'm going to go ahead and set up a new one for you. The type is going to be credit card. I'm going to name my card. I'll just call it Visa. And I'm going to pick the start date of my company file, the beginning of this year. And the starting balance would be the starting balance from my January bank statement. If you don't have your January bank statement, then you can grab your December of 2019 and plug that number in. I'm going to say it was $2,500 and I'll save and close. And now what you should see is that you have a credit card and you owe $2,500. When you make a payment towards the credit card, you're going to actually put it to this account always. Do not try to break it up that so much is gas and so much was meals because there is another way to do that in QuickBooks. All the payments go directly to the credit card account. Going down the list, the next type that I want to mention is where you see equity. Equity basically means equal. If you think about it, you're the owner of the company. When you take money out, that's considered an owner draw. When you put money in, it's considered an owner contribution. Now they've got some other terminology. You'll notice owner investment is when the owner puts money into the business and owner pay and personal expenses is when the owner takes money out of the business. What I don't want you to do is make a deposit from your personal account and consider it income. It is not income to the business, it's considered equity. The next type that I want to talk to you about are your income accounts. I'm going to scroll down just a little bit here. You're going to see that there is one called sales income and typically when you make a sale for your business, this is the account that you want your sales to dump into. You can have a few extra ones added if you'd like. Maybe you have different areas that you do business in and what I mean by that is in your company maybe you have different things that you do and you'll want to actually set those up so you can see how much income you're getting from each one. That's certainly okay. Keep that list pretty short though. No one wants to read 50 different lines of income accounts. But sales is normally where you'll see most of that go into. The next thing I want to mention is your cost of goods sold. Think about the things that you have to buy to make a product or service in your business. You have to buy materials. You're going to need subcontractors sometimes. Maybe you have freight that's part of that. Anything that you have to buy to make a product or service in your business is considered a cost of goods sold. And you want it to show up on a profit and loss as being deducted from your total income. The largest grouping that you're going to see are your expense accounts. And you'll see there are a ton of these here. You'll also add a lot of these. Let me show you how to add some sub-accounts so you'll see how this works. Let's use car and truck as an example. We have the main account here, but I want to add a sub-account called gas and maybe another one called repairs and maintenance. All you're going to do is go back up to the new option in the top right of your screen here. You are going to create a new account and it has to be the same type as the main account. So that means this one has to be an expense account. And in this case, it is auto 
and I want to name this one Fuel. What I'm going to do is check it's a sub account of, and then from this list here, what I'm going to end up picking is car and truck. So see how that fuel is a sub account of car and truck. And when I click save and close at the bottom, I want to show you how sub accounts look. See how fuel looks like it's indented a little bit? That's a sub account. And there's going to be a lot of these you'll want to add. When you're going down this list, think about insurance. You might have general liability. You might have auto insurance. Those would be sub accounts of insurance. Going down under legal and professional fees. Often what I'll see is accounting and the attorney will be sub accounts of legal and professional fees. And you can just come down and make this list look any way you want. There's utilities at the bottom. You'll want to have telephone underneath, gas and electric, any of the utilities that the business pays. That's going to give you a quick overview of setting up your chart of accounts. Make sure you spend some time on this and get it set up the way you want it. You want it to be as detailed as you need it to be to get your numbers, but don't make it so detailed that no one wants to read it. You can always set up accounts later as you go along as well because you're not going to catch them all right away. Well, that's going to wrap up the chart of accounts. Let's go ahead now and move over into Module 4 and we're going to talk a little bit about working with accounts receivable and we'll start with learning how to set up customers. We are getting ready to start talking a little bit about the accounts receivable portion of QuickBooks. If you're not familiar with that term, anything having to do with customers in your business, that's called accounts receivable. Customers are people or businesses that buy from you. You're typically going to make a sale and that's going to be income to your business. We need to talk first of all about how the customer list is set up and then once we do that we'll go into the second section and I'll show you how to add some customers to this list. The way you're going to get to a list of your customers is to go over to your navigation bar on the left, point to sales, and then you'll see customers in the list. At the very top of your customer list here, you can see the dollar amount for any of these categories. You can see that for open invoices, I have $35,810. These are invoices that have been created and the customer has not paid them even if they owe a penny. If you had any of this amount that was overdue, you would see that over here. And overdue means that if you had set specific terms on an invoice, let's say net 30, meaning that invoice was due in 30 days, and the customer has not paid you by then, then some of this moves over into the overdue category. You can also see how much was paid in the last 30 days, in this case nothing. There's also a dollar amount for what we call unbilled activity and for estimates. Sometimes you will get little messages like you see here right above your actual customer list. You can close those with the little X in the right hand corner and then you can actually see the list. The customer list is set up alphabetical by last name. You'll notice that when you look down this list, the list is set up by last name comma first name. You'll want to do that because it's a lot easier to find someone when you're looking for them if it's set up that way. Obviously a business like Adam's Candy Shop would not have a last name and a first name, so it just sorts the first letter, which is A in this case, with the A's in the list. If you see a little envelope to the right of some of your customers, that means that if you click there, you can actually send that customer an email. If their email address was set up, when you actually set up the customer, then it would pull it like you see here. If not, you're going to notice that there's no envelope, meaning that you have not put in a customer email address in the customer information. These are what we call sub-customers. Sometimes they're called jobs, sometimes they're called projects. In the online version, the technical term is a sub-customer. They're both sub-customers of, in this case, Mike Ballack. You can also see the customer's phone number and the open balance, meaning how much money that customer owes you. There's also a column for actions. If you happen to be on this screen and you'd like to take one of these actions related to this customer, you could do that. For example, you could go ahead and create a statement or an invoice right from here. Just know that you're not always going to be on this screen when you want to do those things, so there are other ways to do those actions. 
Notice you can also search for a customer right up here. So if you want to look for Mike Bellick, for example, you can start typing the last few characters of their name and then you'll see that it pops up in the list. Over on the right hand side, you have the ability to print a list of your customers. You can also export this list to Excel if you'd like. And there's also some settings and I want to click on those for a moment because I want to show you that these are going to be the columns that you see up here. If I'd like to see their email address, I just choose that and notice now I have a column for email. Or if I'd like to see their address, I can click on that and now I see their address as well. It's just how do you want to actually look at this list. Another thing I'll mention way back over on the left where it says batch actions, if you have multiple customers selected, from the drop down list, you can actually email all three of these customers, or you can make them inactive. An inactive customer is a customer you've used in the past, therefore you can't delete them, but if you haven't seen them in a long time and you just want to hide them from the list, you can make them inactive. That's a quick overview of the screen itself here. What I'd like to do now is take you over into the second section and show you how to add a customer to the customer list. Now that you've gotten a quick overview of what the customer list looks like and how it works, we need to start adding some customers to this list. Let's go ahead and flip over to QuickBooks and I will show you how to add your first customer. If you're in your customer list, you'll notice in the top right hand corner, there's an option to add a new customer. There's also a down arrow to the right of that because you can also choose to import customers. What if you have a list of customers already set up in Excel? You can just import those so that you don't have to set them up one at a time. We are going to talk about importing customers from Excel over in section five of this module. For now, I'm going to click on new customer. We're going to put in some customer information on this screen and you'll notice the first thing it asks for is the company name. Remember that a customer can be a company, a customer can also be an individual that works for a company, or it could just be an individual and there's no company. In that case, you wouldn't put anything in the company name field. But I'm going to go ahead and put in this customer's company, it's BRC Supplies. And you'll notice that because I typed a B, it starts pulling down a list of different companies that it's found and their addresses. So if I want to just choose one of these, I could. But since I'm typing this in from scratch, I'm going to go ahead and just click over to the side somewhere, and then I can come back over and finish filling this out. This customer's name is Tom Allen. And notice it now has a display name as Tom Allen. You can change that display name to show as the company name or last name, comma, first name. Display name means the way you see it in the list over here. Remember we talked about the easiest way to find customers is to type it in last name, comma, first name. Just be consistent with however you decide to do it. It's also going to use the display name as the same way it's going to put their name on checks. It looks kind of funny if I write a check to Alan, Tom. I'm going to uncheck the box and then I'm going to put in Tom Allen and that way that's how his checks will appear when we put his name in there. Over on the right you see I can type in an email. I'll just say Tom at Yahoo. You can also put in Tom's phone number, Tom's mobile, fax, other, and website. Also, if this is a sub-customer, I can check the box and choose the customer that he is a sub-customer of. We're actually going to do that over in Section 4. Now notice I'm on the address tab and this is where I'm going to put in the billing address. I'm going to go ahead and say he's at 123 and we're going to say this is Billings Road. This is going to be in the city of Bayshore, California, states California, and the zip code is 94326. The country, we'll just say USA. Now you'll notice that the shipping address is the exact same as the billing address. If you don't ship anything, you don't have to worry about that. But if you do, they may want their invoices going to one address and the actual things you're shipping going to a different address. You can uncheck the box and change that information if you need to. 
I'm going to go ahead and hit save and let's see if Tom Allen is in the list. He should be in here as Allen, Tom and he is, you can see it right over here. Now I want to mention a couple of things. When you're in this list, if you have a customer that you accidentally put in, you cannot delete that customer. The online version of QuickBooks lets you make a customer inactive, meaning you hide them from the list, but you cannot delete them. Now what you're going to see is all of the information you had set up about Tom Allen. Notice a couple of things. You can add some notes if you want to this customer's record. I'll just click add notes just to show you. Let's just say that we can put in here this is a new customer for the year 2020. And that's a note that's all you have to do there and now that will show up anytime you want to see that. Notice also there is a tab for the transaction list down here and obviously we have no transactions yet but as we start creating invoices, receiving payments, that sort of thing, they'll show up right down here. The projects, these are going to be the jobs that we actually do for these customers. There aren't any set up yet here. We can also see customer details. This is where we've got all of the information we had just set up for this customer. And then also if there were any late fees, you would see that listed here as well. And that's how you set up a new customer. I'm going to hit this customers link here in the top left and that'll take me back to the list of customers and notice Tom Allen has an envelope to the right because we did put in an email address for Tom Allen. That's pretty much how you put in a new customer. What I want to do now is take you over into section 3 and I'm going to show you how to add a sub customer. Now that you know how to add a customer, let's talk about how to add sub-customers. A sub-customer is basically going to be a way of adding a level underneath your main customer. If you have different jobs that you work on for a particular customer, you can actually separate those jobs by actually creating sub-customers. Then you can look at reports for the entire customer, but also per sub-customer. In the desktop version of QuickBooks, they actually call these jobs. Sometimes they're called projects. Here, like I said, the terminology is a sub-customer. Let me show you how to set those up. To create a sub-customer, we're still going to use the new customer button because it is a new customer we're setting up. They're just a sub of another one we already have existing. When this comes up, all you want to do is put in the display name. You can see in their case, they're using street addresses. I'm going to make up one, 124, and this will be Scottsdale Drive. And the only other thing you want to do is come over here where it says is sub customer and underneath it pick the customer that you want to apply this to. You can also see it says bill with parent over on the right and you do want to keep this together. You can also bill this customer individually. We're going to leave it on bill with parent and you'll see that it actually pre-populated all of this information from Tom Allen's setup. We don't need to change any of this unless it happens to be different. We're just going to hit save and then that's going to be our next level we've created. You can see it right over here. And that's all there is to creating a sub customer. Now a couple things you need to know. If you're using the sub customer feature, you want to use it consistently throughout QuickBooks. If you don't, let's say that you're working on some transaction and instead of picking 124 Scottsdale, I pick Tom Allen. It's still going to go to the right main customer, but on reports, you'll see other and you'll go, what's going on? You want to make sure that you put it to the correct sub customer if you're using the sub customers option. Not every business will use the sub customer option, but it's really great if you need to break out different projects, like I said, or maybe you have different locations for a particular customer, things like that. That's really all there is to working with sub customers. Let's go ahead now and move over into section four and I will show you how to edit an existing customer. 
Once you have a few customers set up, you're going to realize that you need to edit some of the information. Maybe you actually set up the information wrong, or it could be that the customer information has changed. Maybe they've moved, they have a new address, you want to add a website. You can always go in and edit the information about your customers, and it's a pretty easy process, so let me show you how that works. If you want to edit a customer's information, make sure you click on your customer over in the customer list, and then come over here and choose this edit option. Let's say that Tom's email really includes his last name. I'm going to go ahead and add Alan. And let's say that when we set this up, we did not look at any of these tabs. So let's go through those real quick so that you'll know what other types of information you might want to set up when you're setting up your customers. We've looked at the address tab, now let's take a peek at notes. This is where you can add any notes you would like pertaining to this customer. The best thing to do is just drop down after the previous note, pop in the date, and then pop in any notes that you might have pertaining to this particular customer. The third tab over says tax info. This has to do with collecting sales tax from your customer. If you sell physical items and you charge sales tax, you need to tell QuickBooks that this customer is taxable and what the default tax code is. We're going to talk about sales tax later on, but just to give you a heads up, what you're going to have to do is where you're setting up the items or the different things you sell, they actually call them products and services in here, then what's going to happen is you're going to set up each sales tax you need to collect and then you'll group them together to create one big tax so that you're charging the customer correctly. And that's where you would put that tax code. Let's say that it happens to be the San Domingo, we'll choose that. And now what will happen is when we invoice a customer, it'll pull that tax code automatically. The next one is payment and billing. A lot of this is just information for you. First of all, the preferred payment method. Does this customer usually like to pay you with cash, check, barter, MasterCard? You can kind of see the list there. If you need to add a new way that the customer can pay, maybe PayPal, Square, you can just hit add new right here. And then you can actually type in the name of that new payment method and then hit save. And now PayPal will be on the list since I just added it. It does not mean that the customer pays you with PayPal every time. It just means that's their preferred way they typically like to pay you. Preferred delivery method. How do they like to have their invoices sent to them? Do they like to have them printed and you can print them later? Or do they like to have them sent via email where you can send those later? Or do they not have a preference? Terms. You can have different due date terms per customer. If you have a really good customer, you might have net 30. If you have a customer that's brand new, you might say due upon receipt. Now let me tell you why you have this opening balance field here. As of the start date of your company file, how much money did this customer owe you? Let's just say it was $1,000. You could plug that in there and the accounting would be correct. But you would not have a way to go back and see that that was actually three separate invoices you sent them that total $8,000. I like to go back and put each invoice in that the customer still owed me for and not fill this in. But whichever way works for you would be fine as long as the numbers come out correctly. And then of course if you did put an opening balance you would put in the date that that would be as of which would really be the start date of your company file. The next tab over says language. This will default to English, but if you'd like to send your invoices to the customer in French, Spanish, Italian, you can see the list there. You can also have attachments for this customer. What this would be is let's say that you had some sort of file that you actually created, or it could be a bill that you received, something related to this customer. Instead of having to get out of QuickBooks and search your computer for that file, you'll be able to open it right here from QuickBooks because it will be attached. If I click on attachments here, it will allow me to search my computer and find that file and attach it here. The last tab says additional info. You might have different ways you like to categorize your customers. You'll notice they have commercial customers and residential customers, but you can set up this list any way you like it. And that's going to be how those tabs work right there. All you have to do when you've changed all the information is hit save 
and that information is now saved in QuickBooks. Now, one quick thing I want to mention to you, especially about sales tax. If you have a customer you have set up where you charge a certain tax and later you go back and edit the information and change it, it's not going to go back to any prior invoices and change that sales tax. It's only for any new ones you create from this point forward. Well, that's how you're going to edit your customers. Let's go ahead now and move over into Section 5 and I'll talk to you a little bit about making customers inactive. One of the things you can do in QuickBooks is with any list you're working in, whether it be customers, chart of accounts, vendors, it doesn't matter. If you have an item on that list that you'd like to temporarily hide from the list, you can make it inactive. Inactive customers actually will not show up when you're working in other areas of QuickBooks, but if you wanted to actually turn them back on, you could go and activate them again. Let me go ahead and show you how to make a customer inactive and then you'll know how to do it when you're working in other lists in QuickBooks as well. Let's say that I want to make Edward Blackwell inactive. Notice that Edward still owes me $1,125. I wouldn't want to make him inactive because I'm going to be using this customer. He's going to make a payment and I'll need to be able to apply money. Typically, you make a customer inactive if you haven't seen them for a while, or maybe it was someone you set up and you never used. Those would be reasons to make a customer inactive. Let me show you what happens if you try to make Mr. Blackwell inactive and he still owes you money. I'm going to go ahead and click on Edit. And here's where you go to make a customer inactive. Now, this message is telling me that Edward still owes me money. He has a non-zero balance. If I say yes and make him inactive, then QuickBooks will create an adjusting entry so that he doesn't owe me money anymore. I'm going to click yes and notice there's a little error message. And that's because this customer has what's called a recurring template that's being used. Anytime you have something recurring, you have to actually delete the recurrence of that whatever it is before you can go in and delete the customer in this case. I'm going to go ahead and hit cancel at the bottom. And let's use a different customer, Tom Allen, because he doesn't owe us any money. We just set him up. I'm going to go ahead and click on Tom Allen and then click edit on the right. Make inactive. And now it tells me that Tom has sub-customers or projects. Making him inactive will also make all his sub-customers and projects inactive. And that's what you want. I'm going to click Yes. And now you'll notice it says Tom Allen is deleted. Just a little FYI. QuickBooks does not have a feature to delete anything from a list, in this case a customer. If you wanted to quote delete them, you'd have to make them inactive. And they're still not really deleted because they show up in the list, they're just hidden. So you can always activate them again. Now if you notice over here, it says make active. That's how I would go back and activate my customer again. I'm going to click make active. And now you'll see over here, it does not say deleted, but notice the sub-customer does. You'll want to repeat that process with your sub-customer. Select them from the left and make them active. And that's a quick overview of how to make your customers inactive. Well, let's move on. We've got one more thing to cover in this particular module. I want to talk to you in Section 6 about importing an existing list of customers that you might already have into QuickBooks. The last thing I want to talk to you about in Module 4 is how to import your customers into QuickBooks. You might already have a list of your customers in Excel, for example, or in a CSV file, and it'd be really nice to be able just to import them into QuickBooks instead of having to enter them one at a time. You will need to set them up a certain way. I want to go ahead and pull up the Excel file that I have so you can see how it's set up. And even if you don't have the fields the exact same, you can map them once you go through this import process. But let me go ahead and pull up the Excel file and show it to you. And then I'll pull up QuickBooks and we'll go through and import those customers. Here I have a list of three customers I'd like to pull in from this Excel spreadsheet into QuickBooks. And you'll notice that I've got them set up by name, company name, email, phone. You can see the list here. 
Those are the names of the fields that are in QuickBooks that you want to pull the information into. If you can set it up this way, that's the best way to do it, but you can also map the fields if you want once you get inside QuickBooks. But I wanted you to see this so that you would know exactly how to set it up. And make sure you save it somewhere that you can pull it in pretty easily when you go to look for it. Let me go ahead and flip over to QuickBooks and we'll pull in John, Ellen, and Doris. All you need to do is make sure you're in your customer list and go up to the down arrow next to new customer and choose import customers. Here's where you're going to select your Excel or your CSV file that you currently have your customers in. Mine's called customer list and I'll just choose that and you can see it brought that file in. Now all I have to do is click next at the bottom and here I can map my fields to the fields that are in QuickBooks. You'll notice the first column are the names of the QuickBooks fields and over here will be the names of the fields you had in your file. If the names don't match exactly, like this one says name, but maybe in your Excel spreadsheet this one said first name, for example, then you would choose it from the down arrow. If there's not a match, like company, for example, when I look in my Excel sheet, I did not have one called company, then I'll just say no match and it won't be able to pull anything in. The ones with the check mark that you see are the ones that actually have a match to the QuickBooks fields. It sees the exact same name that it sees over in your Excel spreadsheet in this case. Once you're finished going through that list, you want to go ahead and click Next at the bottom. And you'll see that there are three customers now that are ready to be imported. If I had a lot of these, I could go in and search for these by filtering and typing in the name of that customer. It's going to be pulling in the ones that have the check mark next to them. I'm going to go ahead and import all three of those. I'll just choose import at the bottom. And now you'll see that it's brought in those three customers. Let's look first of all for Mr. Stewart. We're going to go down the list here. And you'll notice that here is John Stewart. He was the first one on our list. It has now imported all the information that was in that Excel spreadsheet. Well, that's going to wrap up module four where we've talked a lot about customers. Now that we have our customers in, we can move over to module five and talk about sales transactions using these customers. Hey there, we're working now in module five and in this module, we're looking at all the different types of sales transactions that can occur when working with customers. These are going to be things like, are you invoicing customers? Are you receiving payments from those customers? Maybe making deposits, credit memos, things like that. Before we get started over in section one, I want to go through very quickly with you the sales tab that's in QuickBooks and show you an overview of how it works and what type of information you can get out of it. Let's go ahead and flip over to QuickBooks and we'll look at the sales. Let's go over to our navigation bar and point to sales, and then I'm going to click on overview. This is just a quick overview of your income over time. You can see that I've got $220 that it looks like I've made this month, and I made that the week of February 16th through 22nd. Notice I can actually point right up here as well and see that information. If I wanted to change this and see how much I'd made this month, this quarter, for example, you can see last year, this year, you've got different choices here. I'm going to go ahead and choose last month, and it looks like last month we brought in over $7,000. And you can see the high points of when you brought in the most money, in this case, January 19th through 25. Down here, I can see how many invoices are overdue, and also the ones that I've already sent out that are not due yet, and that's $3,976. I might also have some money I've received that's not deposited yet, and you can see that here, and also I can see the amount that I actually did deposit. Over on the right here, these are some things that you can opt to set up with QuickBooks, and some of these are paid subscriptions. But if you want to set these up, you've got different ways customers can pay you. That would be Apple Pay. If you want them to be able to pay you direct deposit, things like that, you can set those up with Intuit. You can also set up to get paid anywhere. So if you have an app you've downloaded to your phone, you can accept payment right there. Or you can send out an invoice to your customer that they can pay online. They can actually click that invoice and then pay you right then and there. Like I said, some of these are paid. You will want to look into those before you sign up with one of those subscriptions. If you're interested in learning how the QuickBooks payments 
allow you to get paid online or in person. You can watch this video here. And then they have some shortcuts to some of the things we're going to be talking about as we go along right down here. But this is a quick overview of your accounts receivable. Now notice the next tab over will show all of your sales. Here you'll see all the information on any sales transactions. You can see all the transactions listed at the bottom, so you're going to see invoices, payments, credit memos. If you look down the list, here's a time charge. There's a sales receipt or refund. Any transaction that happened with your customer is going to be on this list. You're going to see all the information about the transaction, the balance, the total, and all the way over on the right, you can take an action related to that particular transaction. If you click the down arrow, notice that you can either copy this, you might want to delete it, you might want to send a reminder, you can kind of see your choices there. The next tab at the top that you're going to see are your invoices. These are just invoices that are not yet paid. You'll notice it shows you all the information about each of the invoices, the balance, the total. If it's overdue, maybe not sent, or if it's partially paid, you can see some of these. And then, of course, here's your actions again if you want to take one of these actions related to one of these invoices. The tab that's next is your customer tab, and we've spent a lot of time on that. And the last tab says products and services. Products and services are things that you either buy or sell to your customer. They can be a physical item, it could even be inventory, or just a service you provide. And you can see for all of these that you can look at all kinds of options related to whatever's underneath that particular tab. That gives you a quick overview of how to use the sales option. What I want to do now is take you back and let's go ahead and get started looking at how to actually create sales receipts for those customers that want to go ahead and buy something and pay you at the same time. When you make a sale to a customer, there are a couple different ways to record that sale. One way is to create what's called a sales receipt. This is almost like point of sale. If a customer comes in, makes a purchase, and gives you the money right then, you can put all of that on one transaction and send them on their way with a receipt. The other way that we're going to talk about in Section 3 is actually invoicing customers, and that's where you send out an invoice and the customer pays you after the fact. But right now, let's focus on sales receipts. Let's flip over to QuickBooks, and I'll show you how to enter a sales receipt. You want to start by going to your customer list. Look down the list and find your customer and the subcustomer that you'd like to send a sales receipt to. If you're using subcustomers, always pick the subcustomer. If you just pick the main customer, what will happen is you'll look at reports and you'll see other and you won't know what that refers to. So just make sure you always choose the subcustomer. Notice when I go all the way to the right here and click the down arrow, I have an option to create a sales receipt. The first thing you'll notice is that it brought in the customer and the subcustomer you chose. If you want to change those, you can actually pick those from the drop down list. The next thing you'll see is a place to put in the email. If you want to email this to more than one email address, notice that you can type them both in here, but just separate them with a comma. And if you need to CC or BCC some additional email addresses, you'll see those here. There's also a checkbox that says send later. That's because you have the ability to set up the sales receipt and not actually send it right now. It could be that you're not really sure of the quantity, but you want to go ahead and get this set up and saved. You could do that. You'll see it brought in the billing address, and it also has the sales receipt date, which would be the current date. If you want to change this date, you can just click the little calendar like I did and change the date. Now in this case, they've customized this sales receipt to have an additional field that says crew number. If you wanted to plug something in there, you would just type in the number for that crew or not use it at all. Now we're going to come back to the payment method in a moment. Let's go down to product slash service. If you click your mouse in the first area there, you'll see that there's a drop down list of all the products and services that you sell your customer. If I go down this list, you'll see there are rocks. These are garden rocks. And if I choose that, it will bring in a description and I can edit that description or add to this as much as I like. 
I can go over to the quantity and put in how many of these the customer's purchasing and the rate. We'll say we sell these for $25. Notice when I tab through it, it'll do the calculation. Three of these at $25 cost $75 and this is subject to sales tax. Typically physical items are, but services you provide are not. The little trash can that you see at the end would allow you to delete this line. Now let's say I'm gonna add one more to this. I'm gonna go down and pick a service. Let's say that we have design services, and I'll just put this over in the description. And then I'll say the quantity is one, and we're going to charge $100 for this. And notice this one is not automatically subject to sales tax. I do have a third line available if I want to put something else in here. If you don't see an available line, click where it says Add Lines, and that'll give you a line to type in. Notice you can also clear out all the lines if you wanted to do that. Right underneath it, you have a message that will be displayed on the sales receipt. It currently says, thank you for your business and have a great day, but you can put anything you like in there. And also, if you wanted to put a message and have it displayed on statements, you could put that in here and just type it in. Over on the right, you'll see it shows us our subtotal. You can see that $75 of it is subject to sales tax. And in this case, they're using a sales tax called California and it's 8%, $6 in this case. If you want to give your customer a discount, you can give them a percentage discount or a value, meaning a dollar amount. Let's say I want to give them 10%. I'll just type in 10 with a percent sign and notice it deducts 18 cents. And if I scroll down, it'll show me the amount received and the balance due. Now remember, because this is a sales receipt, we're going to put on this the payment amount. They're assuming we've received all of the payment. Back up here is where I can choose the payment method. If they pay me with Visa, or if they pay me with a check, I can pick any option I like, and there's a little place for a reference number. Now, if you had a Visa card, you wouldn't have a reference number. With a check, that would be a check number. The next thing you'll see is Deposit 2, and it says Undeposited Funds. Your other choices would be to go ahead and deposit this to maybe a checking account, for example. You can see the list. Let me explain undeposited funds for just a moment. In your chart of accounts, you will have an account called undeposited funds. This is a place where money sits that you've collected, but you have not yet taken to the bank. A customer came in, paid you with a check. You want to show QuickBooks the sales receipt is paid, so you'll choose Deposit 2, Undeposited Funds. But it might be that you're going to collect all the monies you received today and make them all one big deposit. That's when you choose Undeposited Funds. If you knew this was the only thing that was going to be in this deposit, you could choose Checking and skip the next step of making a deposit. I'm going to go ahead and leave it in Undeposited Funds, and when you're finished down the bottom, you'll want to either just save this, or you can choose Save and Send, which will email it, or from the down arrow, you can say Save and Close. We're going to close this, and now that transaction has been completed. You're going to notice when we look at this that Tom Allen 124 Scottsdale does not owe us any money. However, if we go over to the All Sales and look here, we should see Tom Allen's sales receipt right here for $180.82, and it says it's paid. Here's where we could go and actually print this. I want to view or edit this. You'll see here that this is your sales receipt where you can make that change if you need to. I'm going to go ahead and get out of this. I'm going to hit the X and cancel it. And that's how you would go in and actually create a sales receipt. That money is now sitting in undeposited funds. I want to take you over to your chart of accounts, which happens to be over here under accounting, and show you that account so that you can see the money there. Let's see our chart of accounts. And here's undeposited funds. Now you can see it has $2,243 in there, but if I view the register over here, you'll see the transaction that we did, and also, which is right here, any others that were already sitting in undeposited funds. 
So hold that, and when we talk about making deposits in Section 5, you'll see how this all comes into play. But one way to keep a check on yourself is if you know everything's been deposited, then there shouldn't be any money in undeposited funds. Okay, let's go ahead now and go over into Section 3 and talk about invoicing customers. We've talked a little bit about sales receipts, and now let's talk a little bit about sending out invoices to your customers. Remember the difference in a sales receipt and an invoice is that on a sales receipt, the customer is standing right there. You're gonna put in the line item they purchased. You're gonna put in they made a payment. The invoice is where you're going to send an invoice to your customer and wait for payment at a later date. Sometimes you email these, sometimes you mail them. really doesn't matter. You're going to receive the payment at a later date. Let me show you how to create invoices for your customers. It's very similar to the sales receipts, but I want to show you where to go to get started creating invoices. There are a couple different ways to get started creating an invoice. You're going to head over to the navigation pane and point to sales. You can either use the invoice option here or the customers. If you choose the invoices option here, you're going to see a list of all of your invoices that you currently have. And if you want to create a new one, you can choose new invoice from right here. If you started with the customers, you would just come back to sales and go to customers this way. Then what would happen is if you had a customer you wanted to create an invoice for, you could check them off, head all the way to the right under the action column, and then you can create an invoice this way. Either way would work, whatever works for you. You'll notice this way, because I had a customer selected, it pulled in all that customer's information. Now if I wanted to change that, I just click the down arrow and choose the new customer from the list. Remember I told you that if you're using sub-customers, always, always, always pick the sub-customer. You want to go with the lowest level so that when you look at reports, you don't see other on your reports. I'm going to start with Freeman Sporting Goods. I'll choose 55 Twin Lane. And now you'll see it's changed the customer email and the billing address. If you didn't have an email set up in your customer setup, then you could physically type an email here. You can also choose to BCC or CC someone just by choosing this option and putting their email addresses in here. I'm going to hit cancel. You can also send this later. If you have this checked, that means that you can create this invoice and then save it and then create another one and check the same box. If you've done that, you can email both of them at the same time. That's called sending a batch or emailing a batch. If you happen to see that something's changed with the billing address, go ahead and change it here. It'll prompt you when you go to save it and ask you if you want to save this permanently in their record. Because we had terms of net 30 set up in the customer setup, you'll notice the invoice date is 212, but the due date is 313, which is 30 days from the invoice date. If I change this to net 10, you'll see the due date is 10 days. Just make sure the due date is the date that you want the invoice to actually be due to you. The crew number is a field they custom set up for this particular exercise. You can go ahead and plug in some number just to keep it consistent there. And then you can pick a product or service from the list to invoice your customer. I'm going to choose installation. And let's say that I'm going to charge them a quantity of one at $200. Remember a service is non-taxable, so you will not see a green check mark there. If you happen to see one, just uncheck it. And if you have a second line, you're just going to type on the second line whatever information you want to invoice the customer for. Here's where you have your message that will appear on your invoice automatically. You can type in there and change that to anything you like. Also, when you're sending out a statement to your customer, then you can have a message on that statement appear as well, whatever you typed in here. You'll notice that you can also put in an attachment. Let me scroll down just a little bit so you can see that. If you happen to have some sort of file that was already saved in your computer, you could attach it here. An example might be, if I'm installing landscape design, I might have hired a subcontractor to do that. And maybe the subcontractor has already sent me a bill, and I want to attach that to this invoice. Over on the right, if you're going to give your customer a discount, you can give them a percentage discount or a value discount. I'll choose value and give them $25 and you'll see it will deduct it from my 200 so now the balance due is 175 
couple things at the bottom you're going to be able to do. You can print or preview this right here. You can also make it recurring. And what recurring means is if this is something that happens on a regular basis, then you can set QuickBooks up to automatically just put this in whenever you've told it to. Let's say once a month, it inserts this invoice automatically. And then you can customize this a little bit. If you want to do things like they added the crew number, you'd be able to add fields like that. At the bottom, you have an option that says save. You have your save and close. And if you wanted to create a new one, you could click the arrow and choose save and new. I'm going to choose a save and close though. And you'll see now that our invoice has been completed. If I wanted to go back and look at this, I can actually come up here to invoices. And then I can look down this list and find the one I'm looking for. And that's how you're going to create an invoice for a customer. Let's go ahead and move on into section four and I'll show you how to record the payment once a customer actually pays you. Now that you've created your first invoice, the customer is going to mail you a payment at some point. Now it doesn't matter how the customer paid you, you're going to record their payment the same exact way. We're going to go in and tell QuickBooks how much the customer paid, the date they paid, all the pertinent information, and when we're done, we'll see that the invoice will show as being paid if they've paid the full amount. If they haven't, it'll show the balance, or if it's an overpayment, it will show that as well. Let me show you how to record a customer payment. Before we receive our first payment, I'd like to take you over to the Reports section QuickBooks. Just head over to your navigation bar, click on Reports, and then Reports from the submenu, and this is all the reports that are in QuickBooks. We are going to take some time in a later module and look through the different reports, but right now I'd like you to head down to a section that says, Who Owes You? These are your accounts receivable reports. If you head over to the second column, you'll see the second one is called the Open Invoices Report, and you can just click to run that one. Now these are all of the invoices that you've sent out that have not yet been paid, even if the customer owes you a penny. If you remember, in the previous section, we actually created an invoice for Freeman Sporting Goods, and we did one for 25 Twin Lake, and here it is right here, $175. I want you to notice that in any report, if you want to go to that particular transaction, you can see this is a link and you can just click anywhere and actually open up that invoice. I wanted to show you this first because once we receive our payment, this invoice will actually disappear if it's paid in full or you will see this invoice and the balance is owed right over here, not the $175 that it originally was invoiced for. Now that you see that, let's head back over to our customers. We'll go to sales and we'll go down to customers. Now let's go down and find our customer we're going to receive the payment for. And this is going to be Freeman Sporting Goods, 55 Twin Lake. You'll notice over in the action column that you can receive a payment. This is the receive payment window, and the first thing you'll notice is it pulled in my customer and my job. I don't need to change that unless I happen to want to pick a different customer and job. I can look for an invoice by invoice number if I want to. I can click there, just type in the invoice number and hit find, and it will search for it for me. The next thing is the payment date. I'm going to say this was received on February the 28th. And here's the payment method. Now here's where you can pick the way that the customer actually paid you. Did they pay you with cash? Did they pay you with MasterCard, Visa, PayPal? If you happen to take other payment methods you'd like to add, like Venmo or Square or even Bitcoin, just come up here to add new. And all you have to do is type in that new payment and then just hit save. And from now on, that payment method will actually be on the list there. Now I'm just going to say in this case it was a check though, and I'll put in the reference number. That would be the check number. And then just notice the money is going to go to an account called undeposited funds. Now hold that for a moment. We'll come back. I want to finish the rest of this and explain this part to you. Now over here it assumed that my customer paid me the entire balance they owe for all of their invoices. And we know that's not always the case. Here I'm going to put in the amount that the customer did pay me. Let's say the customer paid me $179. 
Now, if you notice down at the bottom, these are all of the invoices that are still open, even if the customer owes me a penny. You'll notice what QuickBooks does is assumes the customer is paying all of the first one, the rest of the money goes to the next one, and then the balance of the money goes down to the next one all the way down. Now that's not always how the customer has asked you to apply their payments. Let's say in this case they're not paying the first one, they're paying $175 on this last one, and they're going to pay the $4 on this one, and that's why it was $179. Always make sure that you have the correct invoices checked off and the correct amount over here that the customer is paying towards each of the invoices. A couple of other things to notice. When you look down at the bottom, there's going to be $179 worth of money that's applied. And there's no credit memos right now, but if you had one you had issued for this customer, then you could apply that credit memo to one of these invoices that would be open here. If you want to clear the payment, you could. That would let you start all over filling this form out. And then notice at the bottom, there's a place for a memo over on the left. And there's also a place for any attachments if you wanted to add something here. And that's all you need to do to receive payments. It's a pretty easy process. But I do want to go back up to this right here where it says Deposit to, and talk to you about what your options are. Currently, if you receive payments, the money's going into this account called Undeposited Funds. I'm going to go ahead and save this real quick, and then I want to show you where Undeposited Funds is, and then we're going to come back in a second so I can show you where your other options are. Now, if I close the Receive Payment window and head back to the Chart of Accounts, I'm going to go down here to Accounting, Chart of Accounts. You'll notice that if I go down the list, there's this account called Undeposited Funds. Currently, there's $2,241.52 in that account. This is where money sits that you've received but have not yet deposited into the bank. A good way to keep a check on yourself, if you know that everything's been deposited, this should be zero. Let's look at this for a second and see if we can figure out what money happens to be sitting in here. Notice you can click to view the register over on the right. And what you're going to notice is that right now, it looks like there are three payments sitting in undeposited funds. One of them is being the one that we just received. None of these three are in the checkbook yet because they have not yet been deposited. Okay, so let's head back over to our payment that we just looked at. I'm going to go to Sales and go back to Customers. And Let's go down and find our customer, Freeman Sporting Goods, 55 Twin Lake, and I'm just going to click on that for a moment. And here you will see the payment that we just received. I'm going to go ahead and click on that just to open it back up. Here were your other choices. I could go ahead and put the money right in the checking account, and this will skip the next step that we're going to do. But let me tell you why you may or may not want to do this. If the $179 is the only thing that's going to be in that deposit, then you can click checking, hit save and close at the bottom, and you are done with the whole process. But if you think you might receive another payment, possibly from another customer, and this one and the new payment are going to be together in the same deposit, that's when you want to pick undeposited funds. And this will make more sense once we go through and make the deposit over in the next section. But I'm going to go ahead and click Save and Close at the bottom here. And let's see if that invoice shows that it's been paid. When I go down the list and look at the invoice for $175, it does show that it's been paid in full. If there was one penny left, it would not say paid right here. That's how you receive a payment for a customer when you've sent out an invoice. The next step in the process would be to actually take that money and make a deposit. Why don't we head over into Section 5 and I'll show you how to make deposits. Now that we've made a sale for our business, we've actually invoiced a customer. In this case, we got paid, and now we want to take that money and put it in the bank. And that's where the Make Deposits option comes in. It's always going to be the last step in this process. No matter how you receive the payment, whether it was a Visa card, cash, a check, you're going to have to make deposits, and you want to make sure that your deposits in QuickBooks match what actually happened at the bank. Let's go ahead and flip over to QuickBooks and talk about the Make Deposits option. The easiest way to record that deposit is to click the New button right here, 
And over on the right here under other, you'll see bank deposit. This window here is going to be your actual deposit slip. A couple things you'll want to double check on is make sure you have the correct bank account chosen here. It's very easy to have the bank account that you last used show up in that field and then you can't find your deposit. Notice that the balance in the checking account is $1,201, and this is the date of the deposit. Let's say I'm going to make this deposit on March the 2nd. Now down at the bottom, these are the three sets of monies that we saw that were sitting in undeposited funds. What you're going to do is check off all of the ones that are going in this deposit. If all three are going to be in this deposit, you check them all off. If maybe the first two were going to be in that deposit and then maybe this last one was in a separate deposit, do them separately because you want these to match what actually happened at the bank. Let's say in this case though, all three are going to be deposited. A couple of things when you're looking at this list. Here you can go and change the payment type if you didn't do it when you were actually receiving the payment. You've also got a place for a memo if you'd like to fill that in. And then you can see there's the reference number column and then the amount column over on the right. My deposit will be $2,241.52. Now right down here it says cash back goes to. If you happen to have a business bank account, you're not going to be able to get cash back, but as a sole proprietor you could. If you're going to keep some cash, then you would say cash back goes to this account and you would pick whichever account this went to. You would also be able to have a memo and if you were going to keep 20 bucks, you could type that in and it would deduct it from this total right up here. There's also a place to add funds to this deposit. If I click this little arrow, it's going to open up this part here and I can add some additional monies. Now this could be something like maybe you got a rebate from Staples. You could type that in. If that was the situation, it would say received from Staples. The account would be office expenses or office supplies. Pick whichever account you actually used when you purchased the items for that rebate and put it back to the same account. You've got a place for description, the method, and the amount of money. It could be you're also going to put some personal money into the business. If that's the case, then the account you want to choose is that owner equity, if you remember us talking about that in an earlier module. But remember that everything that goes into a deposit is not always income to the business, so make sure that this goes back to the correct account if you're adding additional funds. Notice if you need more than the two lines, you could add additional lines and have as many lines as you'd like here. You can also add a memo to this deposit if you'd like, or add an attachment down at the bottom. And that's all you need to do as far as making a deposit. Now a couple of just other options, you could print this deposit out down at the bottom, or make it recurring. It could be that you have a customer set up on automatic draft where they actually pay you $1,000 a month, let's say, and this would be that deposit. Lots of different scenarios there. I'm going to go ahead and hit save and close down at the bottom. And at this point, the money's actually going to be in my checking account. Remember, it's $2,241.52. Now that whole process of invoicing a customer, receiving a payment, and making that deposit has been taken care of. Now let's go look in the checking account and see if we can find it. It just so happens that on the overview right over here where we are, the checking account is here. That is one way to link to it to look at the balance. Another way would be going down to accounting to our chart of accounts and just opening it that way. Any of this would work. I'm going to go ahead and view the register. When I look in the register, you'll notice that there's my deposit right there. Notice it says split because it's split amongst multiple line items. In this case, we had three different transactions that went on the deposit itself. I'm going to go ahead and cancel that, and that's the process of actually making a deposit. The next thing I want to do is take you over into Section 6 and show you how to set up credit memos for customers. There are times when you will want to issue a credit memo to an invoice. Let's say you have a customer that just isn't happy with your services and they refuse to pay one of your invoices. You can actually leave it on the books for a while if you'd like, but eventually you might want to credit that off. Let me go ahead and show you how to create a credit memo. 
The first thing that you want to do is look up the original invoice and see what it is that you charged them for to begin with. I'm going to look at Red Rock Diner and you'll see there's an invoice for $70 here. I'll just go ahead and open it up and you're going to notice that we charged them for pest control. It looks like probably two hours at $35 an hour for a total of $70. Now let's say the customer just wasn't happy with us and we're going to just credit that invoice. When we create the credit memo, we need to use the exact same product or service that we charge for to begin with. The way you're going to create the credit memo is come up here and click on New. Underneath Customers, you're going to see Credit Memo. Plug in the customer's name. In this case, it is Red Rock Diner. You'll see it populates their email, their billing address, and it's going to have the current date for the credit memo date. Just make sure you put the date that you would like. We're going to be looking at tags over in Section 9. Let's just hold that for a moment and let's go down to Product or Service. Here's where we're going to put in pest control. Remember you want to credit the same product or service that you invoice for to begin with. We're going to choose the quantity of 2 at 35 and that's going to give us a total of 70. All we have to do now is go ahead and go down to save and close. Now that the credit memo has been created, I want to show you two things that happen on your customer's account. Notice here's the credit memo and it says it's closed and then there's a payment that wasn't there before. Now this payment is where you're going to go to actually apply the $70 to the correct invoice because see how the invoice is still open over here? I'm going to click on the payment. Now if it sees an exact match, it will go ahead and check it often, but if it doesn't, come down and choose the correct invoice and then notice the credit memos at the bottom. So you want to make sure those two are checked so they apply to each other. So you'll notice down here the amount to apply is $70 and that's all we have to do. We're going to save and close at the bottom. And because this transaction is linked to others, it will ask us if we're sure we want to modify this and the answer is yes. And now when we go back and look, we'll see that the credit memo is closed, the payment is closed, and the invoice is actually paid. So remember this is a two-step process. You have to create the credit memo, then go back to the payment and actually apply that credit memo to the correct invoice. Now that you know how to create credit memos, I want to show you over in Section 7 how to actually give your customers a refund. There are times when you want to issue a refund to a customer and that would be if a customer has purchased something and paid in full and you want to actually give them their money back. That's the difference in a refund and a credit. A credit usually sits in their account until you just credit the money off of your books whereas refunds you actually give customers the money back. Let me go ahead and show you how to create a refund. We're going to create a refund receipt, but before we can do that, we need to go ahead and look up our customer and see what it is that we're actually going to refund them for. This is Duke's Basketball Camp. If you notice, they have an invoice here for $460.40 that is paid in full. I'm going to click on invoice to actually open this up, and you'll see that the second line are some garden rocks that they purchased from us. They purchased six of them at $12. And let's say that they're going to return three of them at $12 because they didn't need all six of these. We're going to go ahead and close this now. And now we're going to create our refund receipt. We're going to go over to the new option on the navigation pane. We're going to come down to refund receipt. Here we're going to pick our customer's name. In this case, it's going to be Duke's Basketball Camp. You can see it pulls in their email and their billing address, and we just need to make sure we have the correct refund receipt date. Down here where it says payment method, this is how the customer actually paid you. They wrote us a check, let's say, and we're going to refund them from our checking account. If you're going to actually print them a check, then it's going to let you print this later or if you want to go ahead and print it from here you could leave that check number. Now let's go ahead and put in the correct product or service and we decided that this was Garden Rocks and so we're going to go ahead and choose that 
and remember they're returning three at $12 and that makes $36. If the item was subject to sales tax when the purchase was originally made, then QuickBooks will automatically choose the tax option to give them their tax back as well. You'll notice this equates to $36. The total amount refunded will be $38.88. I'm going to go ahead and hit Save and New at the bottom, and now that refund receipt is done. I'm going to click OK here where it says it was successful. And now let's go back and look at their account. If I'm looking at Duke's Basketball Camp, you'll see here's the refund right here, and you'll notice that it says it is paid. Now, if you want to actually go ahead and print a check, then all you have to do is over here it says Print Check, and you'll notice that it automatically has Duke's Basketball Camp and a check waiting to be printed for $38.88. Just double check that you have the correct checking account at the top and make sure you have the correct check number that your check is going to be. Now if you were giving them cash you would have chosen cash from the option back over in the refund receipt and then that would have just been done. That's really all you have to do at this point. You can actually go down and you can preview and print this and then that will be the end of it. There's the preview. You would hit print and it would print out. And that's how you create a refund for a customer. It's called a refund receipt. Let's go ahead and take a peek now at creating statements for your customers. One of the things you have the ability to do in QuickBooks is send statements to your customers. A statement is basically a gentle reminder to your customers that they owe you some money. Typically statements are sent at the end of each month and they show the activity that happened during that month. You don't have to send out statements, but it's a nice little feature to keep your customers abreast of what's going on with their account. Let's go ahead and flip over to QuickBooks and we'll see how statements are created. When you're ready to create statements for your customers, just go to your navigation pane and choose the new option. Over here where you see other, if you look down, you'll see statement. The first thing you have to do is pick a statement type. You can choose a balance forward, any open items for the last year basically, and then you can also choose a transaction statement. I'll choose balance forward. For the statement date, you generally want to pick the end of the month. That means that in this case, the start date would be January 1 and the end date would be January 31. For the customer balance status, you can choose all, open, or overdue. I'm going to choose all and then apply. And these are all of my customers who met the criteria. They call this the recipients list. If you're looking down this list and you see one that you don't want to send a statement to, just come over here and uncheck the box. Now when you're ready, you can print or preview these down here in the middle. I'm going to click on print or preview so that we can see what a statement looks like. Now I'm going to have one here for each customer. You'll see as I go down the list, there you go. And for each one, you're going to be able to see all of the activity for January 1 through January 31. The first thing you'll always see is the balance forward from the previous month. Notice up here it tells you the total due. And there's a place where the customer can actually send you a check. And if they want to type in the amount closed or write it in right there, they can do that. And then down at the bottom of the statement, it shows you how much of this is in the currently due category, how much is in each of these categories, and then again, the total over on the right. And that's what a statement looks like. You can pick any date range you like when you're creating statements. If you just want to send one to one customer, you can do that. But that's an overview of what statements look like and how they work. I'm going to go ahead and close this. And you really don't need to save or save and send this. Once you've printed these out, you can go ahead and just X out at the top and then it's ready and you can print them the next time. Well, let's go ahead now and look over in section nine and talk a little bit about how a new feature of QuickBooks called Tags is going to work. There is a brand new feature in QuickBooks Online that they're rolling out right now called Tags. And what Tags will allow you to do is 
create certain words that will appear on a drop down when you're in different transactions in QuickBooks and you can choose those and later you can use those to search for things or to run reports based on those tags. If you're familiar with Gmail, we've got something similar in there where we can create a list and tag different emails and then search for anything that would have that particular tag we're looking for. This is still in beta right now. If you happen to not see it when you open up your QuickBooks Online, just know it's coming. They're just rolling out in stages right now, and you may not have all the options related to tags yet, but just know it will be coming somewhere down the line. Let me give you an example of how you might use this feature. Currently, we have a feature in QuickBooks called Classes, and we've kind of been using that in the way that tags will work. But let's say that you have an attorney's office and you have four different attorneys in that office. You might want to run reports on the company as a whole, but you might also want to run reports on each attorney. If you had this list of classes set up, you could just pick from the drop down list in each transaction you're in which attorney that this should be tagged to. And we're going to use tags in the exact same way. I don't know if they're going to get rid of classes down the road somewhere, but tags are going to be a really nice feature. So let me flip over and show you what's in there now. And like I said, if you don't see these options or you see something new down the road, it's because they're rolling it out. It's still in beta. The way you're going to access your tags option is through the gear icon on the top right hand side of your screen. And underneath the list right here, you'll see tags. Now currently we don't have any tags set up, but once we do set up our first tag, you're going to see the top of the screen change and you'll see a section that says money in and money out. Let me give you an example of what we're going to do with our tags. This is a company called Craig's Design and Landscape Services. They actually do two different things. They do design work and they do pest control. And as part of their design work, they have three different areas they focus on. They focus on fountains, landscaping and sprinklers. If I wanted to put my tags in a group, then I could do that as well. And you will see the groups listed right here along with the tags. But let's start with just a tag. I'm going to come over here and under new, I'm going to choose tag. And let's say that I use fountains as my first tag. If I wanted to put it in a group, I could, but I don't have any groups set up yet. So right now I'm just going to hit save at the bottom. And now you'll see my first tag called fountains and notice it's ungrouped, it's not part of a group. Now here's what I was saying a second ago about the money in and money out. Once I start applying these tags to different transactions, I can come here and see the money in or out based on those tags I have. Now let me go ahead and create a group to show you how this works. I'm going to create a tag group and I want to create a group called design. And I'm going to create another one in a minute called Pest Control. Now you'll notice that from this screen here, if I wanted to add a tag, I could do it right from here without having to go back out and hit New Tag. I'm going to add two more because I have fountains and I want to add landscaping. And we're also going to add sprinklers. And I'll just hit Add Tag there. Now let me go ahead and click Done at the bottom. And now what you're going to see is design is a group and notice the down arrow. In order to see the two tags in there, I click the arrow and then I see those two. Now fountains is still ungrouped. If I wanted to add it to this design group, I can come over here where it says edit tag and then I can select the group I'd like it to belong to, in this case design. And when I save it, now you'll see design has three tags underneath. Now let me create one more tag, group. I'm going to create one called Pest Control. And let's say under Pest Control that I'm going to create two tags. I'm going to create one for residential and one for commercial customers. I'll add that one and then come back and add commercial and then add that. And now I'm going to say done at the bottom. And now you can see at the bottom, I've got two different tags. I've got one that's pest control and one that's design. Now the other thing is notice the color blue. I can leave it like this, but if you want, each tag group can have a different color scheme going on. If I come over here to edit the group, 
you'll notice that here I can change the color. Maybe this one can be this yellow color and I can save that. And notice it also made all the tags below it that same color and that way they just stand out a little bit when I'm looking at different reports or things. Now let me show you where you're going to use these tags or tag groups. This will be in any transaction. Let's say that I go over and I create a new invoice. You'll notice that in here you have an option that says tags. You can choose from the drop down list and you can choose more than one if you need to. This might have fountains and it might also have some pest control. And there's your two tags that we're going to be using. Now I will be able to look up reports based on the product or service, but I can also look at the reports based on fountains or commercial. Now let me just go ahead and set something up here so you can see how this works. I'll pick Tom Allen. We're going to go down and pick for a product or service. We're going to go ahead and say this is gardening. And we're going to say one at $50. And then let's see for the next one here, we pick fountains. We'll do a rock fountain and that one was 275. Now let's say also we're going to do some pest control around this rock fountain so that we don't have bugs in there. And now we've got a couple of different products and services here. Now when I go ahead and click save and close here, we're going to go back to our tags and see if we have any money that's in or out of these. And now you'll see that there's $382 money in because remember QuickBooks considers at the time you create the invoice it to be part of your income. When you actually write a check, use your credit card, that sort of thing, that will be on the money outside. So if you had to actually buy some materials related to one of these and you tagged those transactions, you would see the money out show up over here. And that's basically how tags are going to work. It's going to be a great new feature that's really going to help you drill down a little bit deeper than you can now to see where your money is coming in or money is going out. Let's go ahead and do one more thing in this module. We're going to look at some of the reports that have to do with your customers and sales. QuickBooks has a ton of different reports related to your customers and your sales. And I want to take you through and show you some of these different ones that you will want to run on a regular basis to see how your company is doing in these different areas. Let me go ahead and flip over to QuickBooks and I will show you a couple of these different reports. I'm going to head over to the navigation pane and I'm going to click on reports. There are several different categories of reports here, but I want to focus right now on the one that says who owes you and then below it are your sales and customers. Underneath who owes you, probably one of the most common reports is the open invoices right here, which you've seen before. And this is just a list of all of your customers who still owe you money, even if they owe you a penny. You'll notice that it shows you all the information you need about the transaction, like the date, you can see the amount. And if you're on that line and you just point to any of these pieces of information, you'll see that you can click and actually go to that transaction. If you actually change that transaction and then get out of it, when you come back here, as long as you've saved the transaction, the report will be updated. Another one, I'm gonna go back to reports that you'll want to look at is going to be under who owes you customer balance detail. This report will show you all the transactions that occurred for each customer and each job or sub customer. When you first come in, it might look like you're just looking at the invoices and anything open. What you need to do is go up to the top right and choose customize. Come down to where you see filter. And you'll notice that where it says AR paid, it says unpaid right now. Go ahead and choose all from the list and then run the report at the bottom. And now you'll see each transaction that happened for each customer, subcustomer, and or job here. I'm going to go ahead and go back to reports. We'll look at a few more here. Back down to who owes you. There are some other ones that you might want to look at. For example, you might want to run a collections report. This one is going to show you all of the information about the customer. This time you'll notice there's a phone number here as well. So if you needed to make some phone calls and call some of these people, you've got that information right here on this report. I'm going back to reports. 
Some other ones just to notice, you do have the ability to run an accounts receivable aging detail and an aging summary. Anytime you see a summary and a detail, the summary will show you the line item and one total, whereas the aging detail will show every single option that made up that category or that line item that you would normally see. You can see an invoice list here if you like. You can see a terms list. There's a statement list. Just all kinds of things you can look at underneath who owes you. Now, down under sales and customers, here's where you can run things like a customer contact list. This is just going to give you each customer, their phone number, their email, that sort of thing. You can also go in and look at estimates by customer. You might want to see if you have any income by customer. You might want to see all your payment methods, product lists and services, your sales. You can look at those by customer. You can look at them by product and you can also look at them by time or activities. So just know that there's a lot of different reports under those two options right there. Now most of your reports can be customized. If you happen to run, for example, a sales by customer detail, you'll notice that you can come up here and change the report period. I can look at all dates and then I can hit run the report and I'll see all of the information for each customer. I can group these by customer. I can group them by product. I've got all different kind of ways I can group this report. And also something else to notice is that all of your reports are automatically run on an accrual basis, not a cash basis. And you can change it per report if you need to. Accrual basically means that as soon as you invoice a customer, it's going to show as income to your business in QuickBooks, whether they've paid it or not. If you had any expenses, let's say you entered a bill, it would show it as an expense whether you paid that bill or not. We're going to see how this really works when we look at a profit and loss a little bit later. But let's go ahead and just kind of wrap this up. I just wanted you to see the reports that were available for customers and for your sales, and most of them will be under these two headings. Let's go ahead now and move over to Module 6 and talk a little bit about products and services. We're just starting module six now, and in this module, I want to talk to you about how products and services work in QuickBooks. A product or service is something that you either sell your customer, or sometimes you purchase those products and services as well. And you want to set those up and make sure you set them up correctly so that you have accurate reports as far as inventory or as far as some of your uh, profit and loss, those types of things. Let's go ahead and flip over to QuickBooks and start talking a little bit about how products and services work. I'm going to give you a quick overview and then I'll take you into section two and show you how to add some of those products and services. To get to a list of your products and services, go to the gear icon on the top right of your screen. Then underneath the list, you'll see products and services. This is a list of all the products and services that you have set up. Remember that sometimes you buy these and sometimes you sell these. And there are different types of products and services you can create. You'll notice currently mine are sorted by type. If I wanted to sort by any of these other columns, I would click on the name and just sort by that column. You'll see there are services you provide like landscaping, trimming. You'll see that there are different pest control. Those are all services you provide. When you get past the service items, you're going to see that there are actual inventory items as well. Inventory means that you actually sell physical products and you count how many you have. For example, when I look at Rock Fountain, you'll notice that it looks like I have two on hand and I can buy more and add to my inventory or I can sell these and that will take it out of my inventory. There are other types of items that you can have as well. You can have non-inventory items. Those are actually items that you don't want to track how many you have in the back, but they're physical items that you either buy or sell. You'll notice when you're looking at this list that you can see the name of the item. If you're using SKU numbers and you've got those set up, you'd be able to see that here. The item type a description, and this is the description that automatically appears when you pull that item onto an invoice or some sort of form in QuickBooks. You've got the sales price, if there's one set up, 
sometimes it's different for every customer so they just don't set up a price you just do it when you're actually invoicing the customer or if you happen to buy this whenever you're purchasing it if this item is subject to sales tax you would see that here if it's inventory we saw that you could see the quantity on hand and the reorder point that basically means that when you get down to a certain number that QuickBooks will pop up and tell you you need to order some more and you can see that they did not set that up in this exercise the last column that you see is the action column here's where you can edit one of these items if you need to make it inactive adjust the quantity that you might have on hand those types of things but this is where your list of products and services is going to live what I want to do now is show you how to set up some of these products and services. So let's head on over to section two so that you can see how to do that. Now that you've had a quick overview of what the products and services screen looks like, I want to take you in and show you how to create your own products and services. Some of you may only have six or seven in your business. Other businesses might have thousands. It just really depends on what your business does. Let's go ahead and flip over and talk about how to add those new products and services. The way you're going to add a new product or service is head up to the new option in the products and services window. The first thing you need to tell QuickBooks is what type of product or service is this that you're adding? Is it going to be inventory? Inventory means that you want to keep some on hand and then have QuickBooks remind you when you get down to a low number so that you can order some more. That's called true inventory. You can track how many you sold and how many you purchased. Sometimes you don't want to keep any in the back room, and that's what we call non-inventory. It might be a physical product that you buy or sell, but you just run reports when you need to to see how many you bought or sold. You don't really need to keep any in the back room. A service is a service you provide, and then you have the option to take any of those three and put them into what's called a bundle. The example they use here is a gift basket of fruit, cheese, and wine. You might actually add something else to that gift basket like a spoon or a cup or something like that. And you can actually set those up as one of these three types. And then you can create a bundle which includes those three items. Let's go ahead for now and say that we're going to set up a service. The first thing we're going to do is go ahead and give our service a name and I'm just going to call this maintenance. You have the ability if you have SKU numbers for your products and services to put that number in here and also you can add a picture of that particular product or service from over here where this little pencil is. This would have to be a picture that's already in your computer that you can go and grab and pull in. You can also put your products and services in different categories. There's a few already created for the exercise, but if you wanted to add a new category, you could do that by hitting the Add New option and creating a category like you see here. They've got Design, Landscaping, and Pest Control as categories. The next thing is the description. When you actually put this on an invoice, which means you're selling this to your customer, what is the description that appears? Let's say that it says quarterly maintenance. And then the next thing is going to be the sales price. If you have a flat rate you charge for this, then you can type that in and it will pre-populate for you. But if it's different every single time, then you'll want to just leave this blank. Nothing happens here. It's only when you buy or sell the product or service that numbers play into your reports. But let's just say that we have a flat rate of $250 a quarter we charge for this. And then the next thing, which is the most important thing on this screen, is the income account that you want this money to go back to when you put this on an invoice. In this case, they've got it automatically going back to services income, which is where I would probably leave it. But if you wanted to put this in any other account, feel free. It's just it needs to be an income account. Now, if you don't pick an income account, QuickBooks will not say anything to you about it. But you'll look at reports, and they'll be really wrong, and you can't figure out why. Look at the word. The word is income, meaning it needs to go to an income account. 
If this was a particular product or service that you were going to charge sales tax on, then here's where you tell QuickBooks this is a taxable product or service or non-taxable product or service. Typically, services you provide are non-taxable and physical items you sell are taxable. Now, if this happens to be a particular product or service that you buy from a vendor that you like, you can check the box and put in the vendor information. But I'm going to go ahead and uncheck that and click Save and Close at the bottom. And now you'll notice that I have a new service in my list here. It's called Maintenance, and you can see all of the information all the way across. Now, if I needed to edit that information, I can click on Edit here. That will take me back to this screen, and I can change whatever I need to and Save and Close again, and then it will be updated. You do have a couple of other actions you can take under this drop down arrow here. You can make this service inactive if you need to. You can also run a report on this service or you can duplicate it. And that's a quick way to go ahead and set up your new products and services. Now that you know how to set up a service, let's go ahead and look at setting up an inventory product. That way you can see how to tell QuickBooks how many you currently have on hand, and then you can see how inventory is added to or deducted from that number. Now that you know how to add new products and services in QuickBooks, let's talk specifically about adding inventory products. True inventory means that you want to keep account on how many of these products you have in your office. You want QuickBooks to let you know when you get low so that you can order some more. You'll want to actually know how many you have on hand when you first set up your new inventory product. And once you've done that, then as you invoice customers, that is how your products will get out of inventory. And as you purchase them, that's how your products will get back into inventory. Let's go ahead and flip over to QuickBooks and I will show you how to add an inventory product. You're going to add an inventory product the same way we added the new products and services over in Section 2. Go to the top of your products and services list and choose the new option. This time we're going to choose inventory. The first thing you're going to do is give your inventory a name. I'm going to call this one sprinkler clamps. And then we're going to give it a SKU. I'll call this one 55 and then we'll choose a category and let's say in this case that we're going to put it under landscaping. Now here's where you put in the initial quantity on hand. This means you're going to do a count before you set up your product and if you have 10 in the back room you're going to put that in here and that gives it a starting number. You also want to have a date to start this with. And let's just say in this case that I want to go back to the beginning of February. Reorder point. What this means is what number do you want to get down to before QuickBooks pops up and tells you that you need to order some more. Let's just say in this case when we get down to three. The next thing you're going to see is inventory asset account. Now do not change this. This is the account that the value of the inventory will actually go into in your chart of accounts. Remember that inventory is an asset to your business. You are worth more because you have it right now, but your goal is to sell it and get it out the door. This is the asset account the inventory will sit in. And then we're going to put in a description. Now I would put in the same thing. We'll put in a sprinkler clamps. And then if you have a set rate that you charge for this, you'll want to type this in. If you don't have one that's different every single time, then you can just leave it blank. Let's say that we sell it for $2.75. You don't want to change this either because this is the income account that this will go into when you make a sale. When I put sprinkler clamps on an invoice and I sell this, it will go into the sales of product income account. If this is a taxable product, you'll want to make sure that this says taxable. And now we have the purchasing information. This was the selling information up here. This is when you purchase it down here. The first thing it asks for is a description. When you order this from whatever company you order them from, what is their description? And sometimes it'll be the same. Other times it might have a part number at the end. There's just all kinds of different things that this could say. 
What is the cost? And this means on average, what do you buy it for? It does not mean that the last time you purchased this, it was $1.75. Let's just say on average though, it is $1.75 and it will go to an expense account called cost of goods sold. If you have a preferred vendor, then you can pick them from the list here. It could be that you like to get these from Hicks Hardware. And that's all you need to tell it. I'm gonna go ahead and click Save and Close at the bottom. And now I should see my sprinkler clamps right here. You can see the SKU number we typed in, the sale price, the cost. There's 10 of these currently. And when we get down to three, it's going to pop up and ask us if we want to order some more. Don't forget you have some options over here under your action column. If you wanted to go and adjust the quantity, maybe you discovered there's really only nine in the back room, you'll be able to do that. You also have the ability to adjust the starting value. And that's really all there is to adding inventory products. Let's go ahead now and move over to section four and talk a little bit about purchase orders. If your company buys a lot of products, you might want to create a purchase order system for your business. When you do this, it's a way of actually tracking everything you've ordered, and that way you can see what's come in, if there's anything back ordered, that sort of thing. And this is also going to be a way to start the process of receiving your items into inventory. Let me go ahead and show you how to create a purchase order. Before we get started, there's a couple things that you need to know. First of all, if you'd like to use the purchase order feature in QuickBooks, you have to be enrolled in the QuickBooks Online Plus Edition. That's the edition that actually handles purchase orders. The other thing is you're going to have to actually turn on the purchase order feature in the account settings. Let me show you where to go for that. You go up to the gear icon. You're going over to account and settings. Make sure you're clicked on expenses and here's where you see purchase orders. If this is not on, just come over here to this pencil and then make sure you check the box here to use purchase orders. As long as that's good, then you should be fine. I'm gonna go ahead and close with the X and let's go and look real quick at our products and services because I wanna show you how we're going to order some more and put it into our inventory. I'm gonna click on the gear icon under the list, the second column, I'm gonna click products and services. If you remember, we talked about some of these being inventory, and one of these that I wanna talk about right here is going to be this rock fountain. Now let's say we have two of these, but we're getting ready to do a new job and we need to order two more to have a total of four. This is what we're going to order. To create a new purchase order, I'm going to go to the navigation bar and click on new. I'm going to go down in the second column and click on purchase order. And the first thing I need to do when creating a purchase order is to pick my vendor. I'm gonna go down the list here and we're gonna pick Hicks Hardware. If you had Hicks Hardware's email, it would be pulled in right here. You can see there's the mailing address. And then let's talk about the ship too for a second. If you wanna have Hicks Hardware ship these directly to your customer, you can choose your customer from here. If not, then it's just gonna to come to your office. You don't need to choose anything there. Here's the date of your purchase order. And in this case, they're using the crew number field, so we're gonna plug something in there. You can also set a ship via, which would say USPS, FedEx. You can also set a sales rep if you had those as well. Now looking down the list, you wanna use the item details, not the category details here. And remember, we're getting ready to order some more rock fountains. Now let's take the other ones out of the list. We're just gonna go ahead and click the little trash can over on the right. And I wanna get two of these so that I have a total of four when I'm done. Again, if it's related to a particular customer, you'll wanna plug that information in right here. If you were ordering other things as well, you can go ahead and put all of these in here. You have a place to put a message to your vendor, a memo, and at the bottom, some attachments. Once this is done, you're gonna go ahead and send this over to your vendor. I'm going to go ahead and say save and close, and that's how that works. 
If you had the vendor's email address, you could have emailed this directly to them. Other than that, maybe you called them on the phone and ordered it, but you do have your PO in here now so that whenever you go to receive these items, you have something to receive it against. That's how you actually create a purchase order. The next step in the process is that your products actually come in and you're going to go in and receive those products into your inventory. Let's go ahead and head over to section 5 so I can show you how that works. Now that you've created a purchase order, you can actually receive the items into your inventory. The logical process is that once you order the items from your vendor, they're going to come in the next week, 10 days probably, and you're going to want to receive them into your inventory. Let's go ahead and flip over to QuickBooks so I can show you how that process works. Let's head back to our products and services for a moment. I want to show you that if we go down and look at Rock Fountain, we still just have two. And that's because all we've done at this point is order two more. Once we get through going through this receiving products into inventory feature, then you're going to notice that this number will go up to four. All you have to do is head over to the navigation bar and click on new. And we're going to create a new bill. The first thing it asks you is who is your vendor and this is where I'm going to pick Hicks Hardware. And you'll notice as soon as I do that that this little window pops up over on the right and this is letting me know that I have an open purchase order. If you want to actually add the items on this purchase order to this bill just click add. And if you look down here, it's added the rock fountains, it's added two of them, and it's got our rate, amount, and everything we talked about here. Because this is an actual bill from the vendor, we want to make sure that their rate and the amount and all of that is correct. If there happened to be a sale and that's why we had ordered two of these, we would change the rate and then of course the amount would change in that case. Going back up to the top, you'll see that it pulled in our mailing address for Hicks Hardware. We're going to want to choose the terms that are on that bill. We're going to say net 30. Here's the bill date, meaning the date that it was actually printed, and the due date, meaning the date it was actually due. We'll also want to plug in our bill number over here, and that's really all we need to do. There's a place for a memo down on the bottom left. We can add attachments if we want, and when we're finished, we're going to save and close. Now let's go see how many we have in inventory now, and if we're looking at Rock Fountain, we have four of those. And that's one of the ways that things get into inventory through a purchase order. Now we'll be looking at some other ways things get into inventory. It could be you've written a check, it could be that you've actually gone in and used your debit card, but this is a way of creating an order and then receiving that order. I want to go ahead and look at the last section in Module 6 here. I want to look at some reports related to product and services and then we'll be done with Module 6. The last thing I wanted to do with you in this particular module is go through some of the reports related to products and services. There are a ton of reports in here. I want you to take some time after watching this video and just go back through some of the ones that we didn't talk about just to see what's available. We're going to go ahead and flip now over to QuickBooks and I will show you how to get to those product and service reports. You want to head over to your navigation pane and click on reports. If you had saved some of these as your favorites, they would show up at the top here. But let's scroll down until you see a heading that says Expenses and Vendors. Here are your purchase order reports right here. One is a list and one is the purchase order detail. Let's start with the list. You'll notice these are all of the open purchase orders and they're listed by vendor. If you've already received your items from the purchase order, it's not considered open anymore and it won't show up in this list. You've got a couple of options up here. Right now we're showing purchase orders for all the dates, which is what you want, and they're grouped by vendor. 
You can also come over here and customize this a little bit. If you wanted to actually look at some filter options, you can go down the list and show just specific vendors, or if you want to see all vendors, we'll go ahead and choose all from the list. And you can see these other options here as well. I'm going to go ahead and run the report, and I get the same one because I was looking at the open purchase orders, all of them. Now let me go back to the reports list and show you the difference in that one and what we call the open purchase order detail. This one here, I'm going to change the dates because look how there's nothing in the report because it's only reflecting March 1st. But if I choose all dates and then run the report, now I can see the purchase orders that are in here and the details about each one. And what that means is it's going to show me every line item in that purchase order. I'm grouping this currently by product or service. I might group them by vendor and run that report. And of course, there's only one. And then also I have the same customized options that I showed you just a minute ago. If you wanted to choose some filter options, you could. If you wanted to go down and choose some options for the header and footer, which is this area up here, you could edit that. And then you could run the report once you've made your changes. Now let me go ahead and go back to the report list. I want to just mention some other ones here that don't have to do with purchase orders. But you are going to see that if you want to look at things like the purchases by vendor, you could do that. You might look at your purchases by product. Or you might look at a transaction list by vendor, vendor contact list. You can kind of see those reports there. There are lots of these reports, and you'll want to run them on a regular basis just so you can see what's going on and make sure you've done things correctly in QuickBooks. Well, that's going to wrap up Module 6, where we talked about products and services. Let's head on over to Module 7 and change focus and talk a little bit about vendors and expenses. If you're not a subscriber, click down below to subscribe so you get notified about similar videos we upload. To get a free QuickBooks Online Essential Keyboard Shortcuts infographic, click over there. And click over there to watch more QuickBooks videos from Simon Says It.